This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Good morning, it's three minutes after ten and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Thank you for that to start with and indeed thank you for all your kind words this week about our uh, our attempts to navigate incredibly difficult territory without causing any unnecessary offence. And I, I use the word unnecessary there because I don't think you can have any conversations about this issue without potentially upsetting somebody. Um, and that is that is a necessary condition for having these conversations. Having said that, I, I, I was wondering what to do today. I was wondering whether we could distill the situation down to a, to a single simple question. And, and I think we can. I, I was a little bit reluctant to do so because it's bleak. But that's me being a little bit shy, I think, of bleakness. It, 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 it occurs to me that the question now really is whether or not Israel is permitted and encouraged to do whatever she wants. And I was reluctant to ask that question because, well, I thought it was an intellectual exercise, not just on my part. I think a lot of other people have ended up in the similar position, but I didn't really want to take full responsibility for it. But I don't think I have to because the point is now being made in ways that I can't remember it being made before. I, I, I want to refer you immediately to um, the Times column today on page 27. So there is a, a column by a writer called Gerard Baker. Below the cartoon, the, the, the regular cartoon by the genius that is Peter Brooks. And although I'm, I, I probably talk a little about being a little confused by all the journalists talking about journalists at the moment. Is, I, is it because the, the central issue is so horrible and so tricky that we are uh, reading and listening to people banging on endlessly about what, what, what words the BBC chooses to use and what lights the Football Association chooses to, to illuminate? It just seems to me to be in the great scheme of things with thousands of people already dead and thousands more destined to be. It, it just seems a bit luxurious to be worrying about these things, even even up to and including the Daily Telegraph's incredibly hand-wringing front page about the decision to, to publish a photograph on page three. Jo journalists talking about journalism is odd, it seems to me, but perhaps inevitable. Um, and I'm not doing that myself. I'm, I'm, I'm here citing journalism as a lens through which we can view this issue perhaps more clearly. So Peter Brooks's cartoon uh, sees Gaza raised to the ground. There are a few buildings still standing, but it has been levelled. And I use that word uh, uh, advisedly for reasons that will become immediately clear. It has been levelled. Um, and here is the line from Met Netanyahu's mouth is, I'm creating a level playing field. And that goes to places that I'm not sure a thousand words of prose could go. So you are levelling Gaza, where two million civilians live, with a... I think the median age in the Gaza Strip is 18. Did you know that? If you, if you plot the ages of everybody in that territory and, and go for the median, go for the, 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 the middle, the average, it's, it's 18. So, so, so I think it's, it's 40... Plus percent are under the age of 18. It's an astonishing demographic when you think about it. So the 1.1 million people being told by Israel to, to flee and being told by Hamas to stay, that, 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 that almost half of them will be kids. Almost half of them will be of school age, which I just find staggering. But Brooks's cartoon is brilliant because it speaks to the apparent contradiction or the, the, the apparent problem of claiming equivalence or claiming that you are creating a level playing field by raising Gaza to the ground. So leave that hanging in your mind, if you would. Um, and then I'm going to read you the, la the final lines of a column by this man, Gerard Baker, because I wasn't sure this morning whether it would be appropriate to wonder whether we're now at the point where 
the only real conversation is about whether or not Israel has carte blanche to do whatever she wants to the people of the Gaza Strip, right? And Gerald Baker has written in Rupert Murdoch's time, what comes now is a time for war, a time to tear down before someday a time to build up again. For the rest of us, it is a time for silence. The message, and it's, it's one columnist, albeit that he works for the most powerful media mogul in the history of the English-speaking world. It is a column which essentially says, indeed it states in terms, that the Jewish state has the right to respond as aggressively as it sees fit. It has the right, in other words, to do absolutely anything. And I think that's where the debate is now. I hesitate even to use the word debate. I think that's all that's left to talk about, actually. I think that's probably why some people prefer to wang on about Wembley or, or the BBC's vocabulary or the Daily Telegraph's editorial choices because the central question, the only question left, is so horrible. So absolutely horrible. I got another message yesterday which I think addresses this issue um it, it, I, 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 listen i've been around so long now and i've had the same phone number for so long that i sometimes get texts and i'm not quite sure who they're from but this arrived yesterday on my personal phone it said Gaz gaza and hamas are not separate hamas is in charge of gaza and sad as the death of those children in gaza might well be children of murderous terrorists who committed pogroms in Israel, they have... I, 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 well, they have no right to be defended. And I, and I thought, well, that's not true, is it? Or, 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 or is that where we are? Is that, is that the bleak point at which we have already arrived? Less than a week after Hamas... I, 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 I can't even find the words. The terrorist doesn't seem a strong enough word to me. Hamas murderers, scumbags, horrors, undertook a, 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 an attack of unimaginable, unimaginable cruelty. And, and the details of that cruelty, the depth of that cruelty continues to emerge. But within a week, we've reached the point where a columnist in the, the newspaper of record is stating in black and white that Israel has the right to respond as aggressively as it sees fit. And it goes further. For the rest of us, states this op-ed, it is a time for silence. So we shouldn't even criticise or we shouldn't even question what is to happen next. And then you come to the possible contradiction of or contrast rather between what the US and the UK is doing essentially sending weapons and warships to Israel as a almost a, um, a, 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 a public relations show of support while the United Nations warns in in in, in pretty grim terms of potential carnage um, the death toll in Gaza is already above 1,400. That includes 447 children and 248 women. Already. Death toll, uh, uh, Hamas in Israel, uh, the numbers I've got, 1,200, but that has, if it hasn't risen already, it probably will as, as more details emerge. So, although Anthony Blinken yesterday offered unwavering support to Israel, he also spoke of the Palestinian people's legitimate aspirations to live with equal measures of security, freedom, justice, opportunity, and dignity. I, I don't think if I were living in Gaza that I would find much comfort in those words. I really don't. And I think that that is all they're going to get. I think all they're going to get is words. And I don't even think, or I don't even know, whether or not anyone is going to dispute what I've just said. I, I imagine 
you'll approach it by saying, well, what else? I mean, what do you expect Israel to do? Of course, we must go in and kill even more children. And I suspect that other people on, on the other side of this conversation will say, of course, it, of course it has come down to that. And of course, the international community is, is waving it through. I refer you back to the words on page 27 of today's Times. For the rest of us, it is a time for silence. Nobody wishes to see innocent lives lost, is the line below the headline. But the Jewish state has the right to respond as aggressively as it sees fit. And, and nobody, as far as I can tell, is talking about what success looks like. It's been reported since I came on air that 13 of the hostages taken at the weekend have already died in Gaza as a consequence of the attacks by Israel. Who killed those humans? Who killed those humans? I don't even want to answer that question. I don't even know. Got killed by Israeli bombs. But held by Hamas terrorists so who killed them who killed those 13 hostages how can that be a philosophical question how can it not be clear who killed a human being but of course release the hostages and it things won't be so bad i don't know do you believe that so that so there it is just in case anyone's under any illusions that those are the numbers so don't waste tuppence calling me to say that only one side is killing children. 447 children in Gaza are dead already. 447. So, it's 10.15. I think we'll do it like that. I think we'll do it like that. Is that it? Is it now already, in less than a week, we've reached the point where the international community might make a few noises and the United Nations might issue warnings that food and water supplies are already running dangerously low. But the horror of what Hamas did and the history of all of this has now created a situation in which, that's the question I'm going to ask you, has Israel been given carte blanche to do whatever it wants in the Gaza Strip. Is this Times columnist not just calling for something, but actually correctly describing it? 0345 6060 973. I'll just read you a couple of texts because I, I want you to know why I weigh my words so carefully and why, why I find it so difficult to do these conversations in a way that I hope is helpful. James O'Brien Scum. Israel are going in after terrorists, not babies, you sicko. Um, and uh, I, I, on, the, on the other side of the coin, it sounds like that columnist is calling for genocide and for us to just sit back and enjoy the show. So two people listening to the same 10 minutes of radio arriving at completely different conclusions. But that's the question, isn't it? 447 children dead, 248 women dead on, on, in Gaza. 1,200 innocent humans dead, minimum, in Israel, women and children and babies among them. We talked yesterday about the impossibility many of us have in feeling more sadness about one death than they do about others. But not everybody has that problem. Some people have no problem at all. As that text I read you a moment ago attends in saying, no, these children deserve to die because of who their parents might be. That's what Hamas believe. And that's what some supporters of Israel believe as well. Or at least the person that texted me yesterday believes that, as I demonstrated to you when I read that text out. And underpinning it all is the knowledge that this is what Hamas wanted. The second conversation we had this week, Tuesday morning, a, a, a trap that Hamas has set, that, that the more horrible the atrocity, the more uncontrolled the response. And here it comes. And here it comes. 18 minutes after 10 is the time. I haven't 
made any observations or offered up any opinion particularly, except that I think we're at the point now where the only question is whether or not Israel is required to show any restraint whatsoever. And I will now read you the full headline of the article in today's times. Hamas does not deserve Israeli restraint. I've got no problem agreeing with that. I don't know that I would have much truck with anybody who disagreed with it. Hamas does not deserve Israeli restraint. But do Palestinian children in the Gaza Strip deserve Israeli restraint? 0345-6060-973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 22 minutes after 10. Um, and I suppose if I had to pick one thing that encapsulates all of it for me, it would be this. That there is a suggestion that the Israeli attack on Gaza would be moderated or diluted if Hamas released all the hostages that they've taken. And it is simultaneously being reported this morning that Israeli attacks have already left 13 of those hostages dead. I can't make sense of that, nor can you. And, and actually, um, uh, 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 I'll I, I just read out something as well by, as a sort of balance to the, to the ones that I read out before, because I don't want you to think that I'm bombarded with abuse from all sides. Quite the opposite. Martin in Wolverhampton caught, caught my eyes. We definitely have a different view on Brexit, but I have to change my opinion of you with your reporting on this. 100% agree with you. Can't believe I'm saying that, but respect to you. So there you go. A little bit of uh, a little bit of an olive branch all the way from Wolverhampton. Let's get stuck into your thoughts now on whether or not we're at the point where the only thing to argue about is whether or not Israel has essentially been given the right, whether by the international community or by the horror of, of Hamas, to do whatever it wants to the people in the Gaza Strip. Imran's in Woking. Imran, what would you like to say? Hi, um, good to speak to you. Um, so I think it's, it's shocking, really. I mean, I think I, I agree with the article. I think that Israel have been given the green light. Um, I think they've been given it many, many years just, over. Just, just to be clear, the, the article completely <laughs> supports that. It's not, it's not just saying, is that the situation? This article is saying Israel must be able to do whatever it wants and no one should yeah. be able to criticise. Well... I think that's the opinion of um, most of the Western governments. I mean, I, I, I saw the phone call on TV between Biden and uh, Netanyahu. And honestly, it was like it was surreal. It was like I was watching some kind of film set. You know, they're having a conversation about, yep, this is what's happened. This is what they've done. Um, and, you know, comparing uh, Hamas to ISIS. Now, I don't know Hamas, you know, you know I, I'm, I live in the UK. Um, you know, no, but you know what happened at the weekend, and that, that was that was absolutely. ISIS. There's, there's 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 no one on this planet that would disagree with, you know, their actions and and say you know what they did was what was good. Absolutely not. But there are people on this planet that there's, do that. Uh, you know, there's going to there's, there's people, people in this country well. that do that. There's people well, who a small number, but a, but a real number of people who've taken to the streets of this country this week to applaud those actions. But what 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 have they done on the streets? So when we, now what I'm what I'm trying to say is you know if we raise the Palestinian flag. You know, I'm all for Palestine because I'm for the people. Okay, so wherever there's innocent people, wherever there's pe you know, we, we, we can't live in a delusion. We know those living in Gaza have been suffering for years. You know, they can't go left. They can't go right. They can't escape. You know, just this week, he said that 1.1 million people must escape. Escape to where? You know, if they leave, they're never coming back. Um, I just feel well, from, that... from I mean, to answer your question, from the south to the north of the yeah, Gaza the Strip. Yeah. which is a relatively small it's a roughly the population of glasgow being go. being ordered to relocate to i don't know edinburgh edinburgh there you go and and you know coming back to your point you know the the hostages the 13 hostages that have been have have, have died or you know if, if that's a fact i don't know but obviously there's there's some it's evidence been reported. There evidence say. now so that tells me them being given the green light of doing whatever they want. And we can see now the devastation in the last, what, three or four days that they've done to, to, to the buildings. There's family saying that we were just sleeping and suddenly, you know, it's been bombed. So, you know, I think in 50 years' time, we are going to look back at this and say, why did, we, why did we give Netanyahu's government for the last 20 years the green light? Because right now, you know, as a Muslim in this country, 
you know, just me having the Palestinian flag on my Instagram, is, is that insulting? Is that is that is that anti-Semitic? I'm scared. Honestly, I'm nervous because I'm thinking, you know, I've got a good social media presence. I talk to a lot of people. Am I able to support a Palestinian family just by having the flag? I'm not supporting Hamas. I'm not supporting the Israel government. But in 50 years time, we're going to look back and say, how did we even get to this point? Where, and, then, and what we're going to say is we're going to learn lessons from this. Well, you know, I, I, I'll answer your question, if I may, with the words that I read earlier in the week in Daniel Finkelstein's column, which um, which I found very helpful and very powerful, which is, it, it, in a sense, it depends what you mean by Palestine. So if you mean uh, an autonomous, independent state alongside the state of Israel, then there is nothing particularly provocative in, 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 in your flag. But if you mean that Israel will be replaced by a Palestinian um uh, state, then there is something deeply provocative. So I'm pretty sure what your answer to that question is, but it's only fair that I give you the, the, the opportunity to, to make it. What, what does your flag refer to, Imran? And I've got a lot of friends in different cultures. Mm. They would agree to the same thing. But we talk about a two-state solution. I think that's what yeah. we've been banging on about for years. But, you know, look at, the, look at the unshift of power. Do you not, you know, we've got to see this as it is. You know, look at the power that Israel have, probably the strongest army, the, 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 the strongest mindset, the strongest, uh, you know, technology which, in the which, world. Which you could uh, very easily argue is the reason why Hamas should not have gone anywhere near the provocation that they undertook last weekend. And that, of course, leads us both and everybody listening, uh, however deeply entrenched your position may be, to the, to the conclusion that Israel is doing exactly what Hamas wanted them to do, which, again, like the dead hostages just is so complicated that it, it's it's almost it's almost a relief to, to 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 be able to be objective because if you're not objective i presume that these contradictions are and these uh, difficulties are, 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 are crippling mentally crippling it's tough enough from the outside i can't imagine what it's like from the inside some people manage israel repeatedly told gazans this is from gila to get out as it would be damaged, and Hamas begged residents to stay to fight their cause. I think the question of who is responsible for the children's death is clear. Not to me, uh, and, and yes, it is extremely devastating. I think it's clear to you, you're suggesting it's all Hamas's fault, but they're terrorists. If a terrorist tells you to stay in your house, uh, are they doing it at gunpoint? Do you know? Do I know? I don't know. 1.1 million people move to a different part of the same uh, blockaded territory. I don't know that it is simple. Well, I know that it isn't, actually. But I think, Gila, that you have to cling to the idea that it is. Otherwise, you will go mad. You have to cling to the idea that you have, or Israel has the right to do whatever it wants in Gaza, just as some people cling to the idea that Hamas somehow had the right to do what Hamas did last week. I don't know why, as we discussed at length yesterday, why it's in any way difficult to grasp that the objective position on this is, is that you can... You can have a hierarchy of wrongdoing, of course, but when it comes to dead children, I don't know that there is any hierarchy at all. One, one dead child and another dead child. Two atrocities. Surely. It's coming up to half past ten. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.33 is the time. Um, I, I, I mean, I've shared with you my reading this morning. I've done it all week. This, this column in The Times is chilling. Nobody wishes to see innocent lives lost, but... Remember when I told you on Monday, the first time I started discussing Islamist terror atrocities on this programme, and I couldn't believe I would hear from British people who would put the word but in the sentence. Of course I condemn the actions of the terrorist, but... And then they'd say something about Western foreign policy. Uh, my patience was very thin. My patience was very short. <clears throat> There's no but in a condemnation of a terrorist atrocity. Uh, except, of course, that's me being naive. Because as the caller reminded us yesterday, you could bring the Irish Republicans into this. You could bring Nelson Mandela into this and the, and the ANC, you know. Uh, but, but there it is on the other side, on the other foot, if you like. Nobody wishes to see innocent lives lost. But... The Jewish state has the right to respond as aggressively as it sees fit. What Gerard Baker is writing here in Rupert Murdoch's Times is nobody wishes to see innocent lives lost, but the Jewish state has the right to, to take them because of what Hamas did, because Hamas took innocent lives. And I just find that so uniquely depressing. But 
one article I would recommend is in the Financial Times. It's translated in the Financial Times. I'm not sure where it originally appeared. It's by uh, David Grossman, who wrote a, a book called More Than I Love My Life, which won the Man Booker International Prize in 2017 and the Israel Prize in 2018. And here's an angle that we're not seeing much of in the UK media, um, the, the Financial Times notwithstanding. I also, he writes, sense, see a deep sense of betrayal. The betrayal of citizens by their government, by the Prime Minister and his destructive coalition. A betrayal of all we hold precious as citizens, and in particular as citizens of this state, meaning Israel. A betrayal of its formative and binding idea of the most precious deposit of all, the Jewish people's national home, which has been handed to its leaders to safeguard, and which they should have treated with reverence. But instead, what have we seen? What have we grown accustomed to seeing as though it were inevitable? What we've seen is the utter abandonment of the state in favour of petty, greedy agendas and cynical, narrow-minded, delirious politics. What is happening now is the concrete price Israel is paying for having been seduced for years by a corrupt leadership which drove it downhill from bad to worse, which eroded its institutions of law and justice, its military, its education system, which was willing to place it in existential danger in order to keep its prime minister out of prison. I cannot recommend that article. Um, enough it's 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 sobering it's beautifully written and it is profoundly alarming and enlightening 10 36 is the time back to the phones jeff is in woking jeff what would you like to say good morning james Hello. Uh, first of all i'd like to say that i believe you and your colleagues on lbc have been extremely balanced in your commentary on last weekend's atrocities um, I would like to disagree with your last caller. Okay. Um, during this week, I've heard senior U.S. and U.K. politicians uh, condemn the the, uh, the atrocities by the terrorists, yes. and they've said that Israel has a right to respond, but the emphasis has been on a proportionate manner, in a proportionate way. That would dis- exclude targeting innocent men, women, and children and uh, hostages in, in Gaza, and to, to target only the, the terrorists. Um, well, I, I mean, no they, may have, these... they may have said that, but there's 447 children dead already in the Gaza Strip. Yes, but the politicians from the US and the UK have made it clear they do not condone uh, a carte blanche green light for uh, a mass genocide in, in that area. Did you hear Grant Shapps being interviewed elsewhere this morning? I don't take much notice of grass chaps, to be honest. That's, but, a very, uh, that's a very good rule for life at the best of times, Jeff. But I, 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 it would offer up some challenge to what you've said, uh, a failing really to to say what you've just said. And he, of course, is, uh, and, and this is something that I have to say with a deep sigh in my voice, he is currently the Secretary of State for Defence of the United Kingdom. Yes, he is. But I also heard David Lamming uh, at the conference. Well, he's not and in also- government. No, he's not. But he's a senior UK politician yes. with a lot of influence, and I believe he's uh, he's been in. So contact if we're sending with... two warships and saying yes. the response must be proportional, uh, at what point do you think the warships would be called back? Well, I think they're possibly on standby to uh, uh, retrieve and and return home uh, hostages that may come from Britain. Uh, that's one of their roles for them out there. But they're, they're, they're there to, in a way, in a sort of a peacekeeping way. Well, they're way, there to take... show support for Israel. I mean, they, yes, that's yes. been stated. So it, what, what if Israel... So the politicians say the words, the warships turn up off the coast. What does proportionate mean in those circumstances? For 447 dead children already, and the, and the invasion yes. hasn't even... The ground offensive hasn't even started. How many children would have to die before... The, the, the politicians using the word proportionate decided that this wasn't something they wanted to support. Well, I think I think the the, the the governments with influence in that area really do need to put pressure on Israel to show uh, restraint. But what is and, restraint? And what is restraint, well, do you think? Re- restraint is, is, as I say, is to target the terrorists responsible for the atrocities last weekend and to avoid... Uh, killing and there's hostages. the problem Jeff for me I don't think you can yeah. I don't, so if you've got well, the ch- so listen ideal world you have magic bullets that only chase down terrorists or, or, another, or, or Hamas loyalists 
uh, unideal, whatever the opposite of the ideal world is, you, 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 you kill everyone in the hope of catching some terrorist in, in your net. And I think that's where we are. Another, another, another role for the, uh, the British uh, warships that are out there is to dissuade other uh, countries and, and organisations in the area from uh, getting involved in the conflict because there are other countries that would like to get involved Maybe. On, on either side, but that's, 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 a, that's a potentially useful role for those boats out there. And, and indeed other countries already are involved. So just on a personal level, Jeff, at, what, at yes. what point do you think, for you, would those words from those politicians become hollow? Because at the moment you've got faith in them, and I envy you that. I, I, I'm not. I'm not saying I've got 100 percent faith. Okay. I know what they've said. Yes. And but I think what they need to do is emphasise what they've said, and and put pressure on Israel to show restraint. And but we and don't know what restraint is, do we? Neither of us, well, you nor me, nor them, probably. Well, that that that's the restraint I'm thinking of. That they, they if they go into uh, Gaza, they ensure, or they're made to ensure that they don't harm innocent men, women and children and this. hostages. I don't know that well, you can do that. There's 13 hostages already dead, reportedly. There's 447 children already dead and it hasn't even started yet, which is why I, I don't know. Guilty is not quite the right word. I, I feel uncomfortable taking you from a place that's more comfortable than the place that I'm in because I think we're now at the point, and this column in The Times almost proves it, where where we are divided, everyone engaged in this is divided now on the question of whether or not there is any requirement of on, on Israel to show restraint. And, and, and lots of people think there isn't. Lots of people think there isn't, including, I would say, some of the politicians calling for restraint, Jeff. I think that their actions speak much louder than their words. Matt's in Kingston. Matt, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um so, yeah, I do think that as it stands, the international community are pretty much giving Israel carte blanche to do whatever they choose. Um, and fair enough, you've got uh, international law that states that certain things are war crimes and so on. But the reality says that, you know, after 9-11, the US and the UK and others went to Iraq and Afghanistan and leveled those countries and, you know, had pretty much away at what they wanted as a retaliatory act. Yeah. So, you know, chances are Israel could go in there, do, you know, level the place and kill a load of civilians and not much is going to happen to them. And these ships that are out there, they're there to show support and deter others from getting involved. But nobody's looking at what else can be done to try and de-escalate the situation. How can this be taken to a, a, a different um, outcome you know how could in this scenario if um, there was a call to put in peacekeepers the UN is a peace organization the whole point of it is to create world peace and to avoid war and so on if there was a call for UN peacekeepers to go in there if we had countries from that region that you know can go in there and act in a way to try and de-escalate it there has to be something that can be looked at. I don't know that they'd be welcomed in by any. I don't know that they'd be welcomed in by anyone. And and I, I listen. Just apropos the United Nations peacekeepers, I've been reading a bit about Rwanda this week and the and the um, uh, the, the genocide there, which was mm -hmm. not quite ignored by the West, but it was very, 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 very underreported. And and the United Nations peacekeepers, um, let's just say, mate, they don't do exactly what it says on the tin. Well, yes, yeah, Sudan. I mean, yeah. So it's all there, but but, but I mean, so so that, I mean, you're, you're we're on the same page. I don't know who can be on a different page, really, because all, all that now is under dispute is whether or not Israel should be free to do whatever it wants in Gaza, it, up to and including no, it, thousands of innocent deaths. Well, no, of course. I mean, it, if we don't try to find different ways to resolve situations, we're just doomed to carry on. We can't just keep on. Uh, you know, you killed one of mine, I'm going to kill a hundred of yours. And, you know... Well, we're I, gonna... I, yeah, you say we can't, but we can, of course. Uh, uh, yeah, we can, of course. <laughs> and but, we are. You know, it, 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 in a world where we're supposed to be becoming smarter, more intelligent, and you know, looking at different approaches to things, if we continue to commit the worst acts, you know, it, it, because we feel justified... Uh, Justified by the atrocities that, that were undertaken by Hamas. And, and so, 
And so the world turns. So the so the so the one justifies the other. And I suppose the question of restraint, the question of proportionality, is the hardest one of all because there is no proportionate response to the mutilation of babies, really, except I suppose the mutilation of babies. I, I mean, what does proportionate even mean in this context? I, I have respect. Thank you, Matt. I don't know if respect's the quite the right word, but I, I'm so, as I get older and mellower, I understand how hard you have to work to justify this. If you, if you are there now saying well no of course we've got the right to do everything uh, up to and including more and more and more dead children so uh, jones had a go uh, Seventy thousand french civilians died as a direct result of the d-day landings and associated actions she writes should the landings not have taken place were the landings proportionate I, i've got no idea what, what you're talking about in in the context of this dispute in, in, in the same way really that quite i mean the the, the attacks upon the Gaza Strip by Israel r render this o almost incomparable to anything else that's gone on before in in the context of war. You know, because y you normally know what the point of a war is. It's about reclaiming territory or it's about repelling invaders. So uh, in the case of the D-Day landings, it's about pushing the Nazis back out of France, you know, and, 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 and defeating them. What does that, what's the parallel there? What's, what's the parallel here? Occupying the Gaza Strip? No one's calling for that. Getting rid of Hamas? Well, this is the biggest recruitment drive Hamas has ever seen, potentially. So I, I just don't... I know that you've got to work hard to try and think that there's a historical precedent or there is a logical or a, an intellectual rationale for it, but they, you just end up sounding silly when you start trying to compare it to... Uh, to the D-Day landings. 10.46 is the time. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. 10 at 49 is the time. I, I, I didn't want to interrupt the last caller talking about a kind of uh, consolidation among Western leaders because I'm not sure it's accurate, but I do know that Leo Varadka, the Irish Taoiseach, has gone in a very different direction from Rishi Sunak, uh, giving an interview to the uh, Irish state broadcaster. Um, I think yesterday morning, he said Israel is under threat. They do have a right to defend themselves, but they don't have the right to breach international humanitarian law. Israel is a country that is surrounded by these brutal, savage groups like Hamas and Hezbollah, countries like Iran, often supported by Islamic fundamentalists and anti-Semites around the world. I'm really concerned about what I'm seeing happening in Gaza at the moment, he said. To me, it amounts to collective punishment, cutting off power, cutting off fuel supplies and water supplies. That's not the way a respectable democratic state should conduct itself. That's Leo Varadka, um, really framing our question in even more brutal terms than we've done so far ourselves, because he's essentially, we, we are essentially asking this morning whether or not um, Israel has the right to breach, breach international humanitarian law because of the threat that Israel is under and because of the horrors of last weekend. And I think that's where the debate is. I think that Gerald Baker in The Times is essentially arguing that Israel should be left to break international humanitarian law when, when he says, we must stay silent. They can, they can I'll read you the exact words. What comes now is a time for war, a time to tear down before someday, a time to build up again. For the rest of us, it is a time for silence, i.e. shut up, stop pointing out breaches of international humanitarian law. But that, there it is. I, I, you know, I'm not picking a side in that particular fight. I'm just pointing out what the fight is. Debbie is in Tel Aviv in, in Israel, of course. Debbie, what would you like to say? I'd like to say that I, I am... I'm really confused by your sort of logic that doesn't make sense to me. Okay. Because, because what Hamas did in the south of Israel, and I was there, I was in a bomb shelter with my grandchildren, what it did in the south of Israel, it wants to do to the whole of Israel. Hamas wants total destruction of Israel. Israel is not in Gaza. Israel left Gaza. Israel wants to divorce Gaza. What Hamas... I mean, they were they were stopped. But had they managed to do this, had they managed to do what they wanted to do, they would have done this to all of us, including me, including my grandchildren, including everybody in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Mm. So that's their aim. And for the last umpteen years, they've been sending this is what I don't hear at all on the English radio. They've been sending rockets into Tel Aviv, into all our major cities. 
And it's only because we have invented this iron dome thing that catches the rockets that millions and thousands of people haven't been haven't been killed. Mm. I mean, they're indiscriminately, and and the and the. English media that I listen to calls them homemade rockets, like apple pie or something. I mean, these are rockets that can kill thousands of people. And if they were, if the Iron Dome didn't catch it, it certainly would have landed on our house. And I, I it's you're not de- you you're talking as if you're dealing with rational people, and and you're really not. They're out for your total and utter destruction. And Israel, I don't think people realize this because Israelis are noisy and all over the place, but Israel is smaller than Wales. So if you attack from the south and attack from the north, there's not a lot of middle to, you know, it's more than the Wales. We have 9 million people and we've lost about, I would say probably it's going to get to at least 1,500. Well, 1,500 out of 9 million in a day is a hell of a lot of people. Well, if, no one's disputing that, and um, one thousand five hundred out of out of two million in a yeah. week is a hell of a lot of people as well. What? Yeah. What? what I, 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 I don't want to make have a conversation about myself, but what? What is it you're confused? Okay. What is it you're confused? I'm by? In, I'm confused that you that there doesn't seem to be an understanding that we're dealing with a group of uh, uh, an oppressive, tremendously oppressive regime that was elected for four years, has been there for eighteen years completely oppresses their people. Try being gay in Gaza. You will, you'll last about 10 minutes. Completely oppresses their people, comes across to this country, tries to get from top to bottom. I mean, thank God it only, you know, it only managed to go pretty far south. Is continuing to send rockets into Tel Aviv, into everywhere, absolutely indiscriminately. And you're comparing that to a situation where Israel is warning people to leave places, which not many armies do, that the Hamas have put weapons inside people's apartments, inside schools and inside mosques. I'm comparing 447 dead children in Gaza to the dead children in Israel. And I'm I'm seeing... Children in Israel I'm seeing the were, same. Were I'm seeing the same tragedy. You can't. I don't think it's the same at all. I know you don't. I mean, I think. So you're not really I, confused I, at all. I'm confused because no. I tell you where I'm confused because I don't understand what option you are giving. You keep saying this is bad, but I'm not hearing the alternative. If the, if the, I mean the, I mean the alternative is that we just self-destruct and Israel disappears so, off the so, map. So what is the current mission? Do you think what is the current plan? The current plan, as I understand it, and I'm not, I'm not a politician, the current plan, as I understand it, is that Israel has had Hamas on its borders. No, no, in, term, in, terms of, in, terms, in terms of what the Israeli army the, is about to, to do. Get of the, to get rid of the Hamas government. Okay, so... Ha, and, and they built a wall... By killing as many out. Palestinians as possible or not? But why are they? Why I don't understand what you're saying. I okay, know that I'm, I'm going to say I mean, it again, why? Debbie. I, no, hang on, okay. please. I've listened to you quite a lot. Yeah. I, I'm going to say it again. Sure. They're going to wipe out Hamas by killing as many right. Palestinians as they possibly can. That's the plan. Absolutely not. What is that the plan is so then? Horrendous. What's the plan then? That? I'm asking if that's what you're saying. The so, plan is yes. to take out terrorists. How? If terrorists are hiding in mosques. How, but how? Or hiding. I don't know. How would you take out terrorists? What's your best plan to take out terrorists who want to wipe you well, off? Well, I've just told the you. I, the only way I can see that well, happening. Please tell me an option. Uh, no, tell I will. You option. kill as many Palestinians as you possibly can and hope that some no. of them are terrorists. But why are they killing as many Palestinians as they possibly can? Because they want to get the terrorists. Warning, if they're giving a warning for them to leave. And why is Egypt shut the border as well? well the, you're I mean, jump, you're jumping Egypt around a lot. Let's, like let's focus on. Either. Let's focus on what you're confused about. Which, okay, which, which, I'm confused yes. as to why, as to why. So how are we going to kill the terrorists? That's what I but want to what know. Would you, no, what I want to know is what you want to do. I've got no like beef with Israel you. I'm not, I'm not arguing with you. No, I'm, talking, I, I I'm not talking about what okay. I want Israel to do. I'm talking about what Israel is doing, and you're confused. Okay, you, it seems to me, it seems to me that the plan is, if you just let me say it, and then we can respond yeah. respectfully to okay. each other, it seems to me sure. that the plan is to kill as many Palestinians as possible in the hope of getting as many members of Hamas absolutely as possible. Not. I don't know where you got that So from. what is that the is plan then? Absolutely not. So why are they killing the so plan? many Palestinians? Because it's a very, 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 very crowded area. Yes. And the Hamas so how can you get the Hamas sure without killing others? 
Well, Hamas have made sure to put their weapons in very crowded places. So Israel is saying, please get out so that we can get rid of Hamas because Hamas so how, is trying how, how to destroy How can you get us. the terrorists without killing the civilians? Well, what we, I just, I just, what I'm not hearing from you, and I'm really trying, is an alternative. Imagine so that they I, I don't have been an alternative. In the south I don't have an alternative. And they come up and raped all the people in Tel Aviv. I don't have an alternative. And killed everybody else. Well, I don't have. Do I don't suggest? have an alternative. If if the priority well, the above all else is to kill members of Hamas, the plan. No, the plan the must. The priority is to survive. Is, the okay, priority. by killing. By we just if we can just explore one avenue of the conversation okay. together. But, Let, so no, why are you so reluctant how? to just say yes? We, we, it is so important that we kill Hamas. It doesn't matter how many other people die in the process. Because I don't believe that's true. So what's the limit then? That's true for how, how many no, is too many? Second. Why did you no, say that 447 dead children in Gaza are different okay. from dead children in Israel? Well, the dead children in Israel, if with respect, have been yeah. beheaded and burnt and had their limbs cut off yes. and shot in cold blood, which is a little bit different than asking people to leave. Why do you keep insisting on, on their, their being invited to leave? The 447 yeah, the children Hamas are already dead. Start, well, Hamas is telling, when were Hamas, they told to leave? Hamas is telling them to leave. Hamas is when were the 447 dead children told to leave? I don't know. I mean, I assume they well, were told You kind of need like to know. Else. You need to know to make the points that I you're making. I need to know because I know that Israel is sending messages to leave. Okay. So what, what, okay. What, what I want to address is your original confusion, which is about why I'm asking a question, um, which well, essentially... I don't understand which, what the well, I'm, option I'm, I'm is. Going, no, well, it's not my job to provide an option. It's my job to describe what's happening. And what is no, happening I, is I that many people, you yourself talking? included, feel that Israel is entitled to pursue Hamas regardless of what I suppose we'd have to describe collateral damage. And what you're confused by is the sorrow I feel for a dead Jewish baby is exactly the same as the sorrow I feel for a dead Arab baby. That's well, what I you're confused That's I what you're confused by. The bit that confuses me is the bit where I feel that the way that it is being described by you is missing the point that Hamas is determined to wipe Israel off the map. I've made that point a hundred times this week. I've read their, Iranian, I've read their charter. I've talked about. I've, okay. I've, I mean, I can't only make the point with words. I can't make it with anything else. No, I, can't, I, I can't. That, but I can't hypnotise you. I've made that Iranian point several, several times. But we're not talking well, about what? any of this today. All we're talking about today is the very simple question of whether or not people believe Israel has the has the right now as as the as the column in the times suggests to do whatever they want in pursuit in pursuit of Hamas has the right. I don't but believe do. that Israel has the right okay, I so, don't. so what I shouldn't don't what shouldn't Israel, Israel, Israel do right. what shouldn't Israel, Israel do Israel as far as I understand it is working hard as much as possible to keep the international law in a place that is very crowded. Okay. I do not... So I have cutting off power, across. cutting off fuel supplies, cutting off water supplies, that, that is quite probably in breach but of international if humanitarian if, law. I, I, I know, listen, if, I, I don't, I, I, we can part as friends, I hope, Debbie. I, know, I, I can't address I your confusion and you can't understand why I'm as sad as about a dead Palestinian I, no, I as I am I about a dead Israeli. Why not? Why are you putting words in my mouth? I am because I'm you a told social me worker. Earlier. Okay. I'm a social I, I need worker. To go to the news. I am very, very upset of course. about every Palestinian death, and I'm very sad that okay. they're living well, under I'm this sorry that I, I didn't mean regime. to put words in your mouth. And, and I, you I, really I, did. I, well, I, I can only apologise if that's, if that's what you felt. It's one minute after 11. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Five minutes after 11 is the time. It is um, uh, just unbearable. Frank in Barnett says it's a completely hopeless and devastating situation on all sides. That is what you are accurately describing. Um, and uh, I just allow myself a, a little space here. James, you're handling this subject with integrity, incredible skill, and are able to separate callers' prejudices from the facts. Um, and you mentioned that you train social workers. I, and listen, prejudice is simply meaning a position that you hold before a situation unfolds, before the facts change. And then, of course, the question comes down to whether or not when the facts change, you change your mind. So perhaps we should talk... Um, 
a little about this uh, notion of, of Israel telling Gazans, telling Palestinians in the Gaza Strip to move before the bombs drop. I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't know how feasible that is. Did the people that are already dead not get the message? Hamas uh, ordering them to stay? Did Hamas use guns? The Israeli government says, get out now, otherwise a bomb will fall upon you tomorrow. And Hamas says, stay where you are, otherwise I'll shoot you today. I, I don't know. I'm probably exaggerating the position, but it sounds very inadequate to me. It, you know, if, if, if it were the case that people were able to remove themselves from the danger zone, then there wouldn't already be 1,500 dead people in the Gaza Strip, would there? And the massive majority or a significant majority of them are, of course, children. And, and that's why, I, I, I mean, Debbie's call was very important because no one really wants to admit what Gerard Baker admits in The Times today, which is that they are supportive of anything now in pursuit of what? in pursuit of vengeance for the absolute horrors of last weekend or in pursuit of, of the destruction of Hamas, which I suspect is impossible, not least because every adult that dies this week leaves a child who becomes immediately more likely to be radicalised as they grow older. And and we spend our time in this country when we're, we're not talking about the... Uh, Hey, look, simple question. How many dead children in Gaza is too many? You could say one. How many dead children in Israel is too many? I would say one. You can't say that. You can't say anything. You have to pretend that it's got something to do with D-Day or it's got something to do with... Uh, that, that, or it doesn't count as a, as a killing because they were given a warning that they were about to be killed. It's, it is just horrible. And I think that's why. And I, I, I understand the temptation. I, I think I almost wish that I was susceptible to it. I'd rather be talking about what, what words the BBC chooses or what flags the Football Association flies. I'd, I'd, I'd much rather be talking about that or, or the editorial decisions of the Daily Telegraph because to actually talk honestly about what's actually happening is almost impossible or, or it's impossibly awful. Because you, you can't. Either you believe that that life is worth more than that life, in which case it's quite easy to engage with this conversation, even though you might not be ready to say out loud that it, it, you know, if, 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 if one of my mine dies, it is much, much worse than if one of them dies. I don't even think that's an evil position or a difficult position to understand. We all feel a bit like that. If this was the Second World War, and, and you, you, you wouldn't feel the same about a German baby dying as you would about in Dresden as you would about a British baby dying in the Blitz, would you? You just wouldn't. So I'm not even condemning or criticising that position. But it's mad to talk about it from the outside. I, I, for me, Hamas is much, 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 much worse than the Israeli government. But that doesn't change the value of the children killed by both. Does it? Because Hamas is worse than the Israeli government. A child killed by Hamas has more value than a child killed by the Israeli attacks. Of course not. And I think if I was invested in Israel for reasons that are hundreds of years old, remember, that line from Finkelstein on Tuesday, I think, about liberated Jews in a, in a, in a death camp asking where do they go? Where do we go? I asked a guard, a, 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 a Russian soldier who liberated them, are there any Jews left in Poland? And he'd come through Poland, he said, I didn't see any. Where do we go? We go to Israel. So, I, I, listen, this has been a journey for me over the years I've been doing this job. I get it. I get it. The, the, the role that Israel plays in, in the, uh, the, the, the minds of Jewish people is impossible to fully, fully empathize with if you if you don't have a history of persecution a history of pogroms and holocausts of course it does but it doesn't make me care less about palestinian babies than i do about israeli babies and, and that is what people find confusing that's what people like debbie find confusing you don't get it hamas are so obviously awful that we must be free to do whatever we want in pursuit of them however many others die and I get that too. I just don't agree. And I'm allowed not to agree. 
And if I was born under a different sign, I would think differently. If I was born in a different country, I'd think differently. If I was born into a different family, I'd think differently. But I wasn't, and I don't. I don't get it. What would I do differently? Well, I have no idea. But I try really, really, really hard not to kill people who've done nothing wrong. I try much, much harder than Hamas do not to kill innocent people. That, that's what I'd do differently, if, if, if that counts as an answer. And the fear is, and indeed in some corners the accusation is, that they're not trying any harder than Hamas to avoid killing innocent civilians. But you need to cling to the idea that they are, which is why you keep intoning about these warnings, which seem to me to be at the very best inadequate and at the very worst utterly meaningless. I need to believe that we're different. So we're giving warnings that you're about to die. So move. I, I don't know. And the other bit I don't get, to be logistical about it, and, and Anthony King, the uh, professor of um, uh, security at Exeter University, talked about this yesterday. I mean, what's the, what's the point? Because if you're telling civilians to flee, then the terrorists will flee as well, won't they? So you're just trying to destroy the infrastructure, the tunnels, the, the, the weapons, rather than the people. I, that, I suppose it's why suicide bombers came into existence back in the day. I think the first instances of suicide bombers were Tamils in Sri Lanka, actually. It's not, not, not in the Middle East, but these are, um, these are side issues, aren't they? So, so that, there it is. As Frank in Barnet is, is just right, isn't he? It's a completely hopeless and devastating situation on all sides. That is what you are accurately describing. And, of course, it's easy for us to say, Frank, because we're not in it. It's not our family that's dying. It's not our children being butchered by Hamas or bombed by Israel. I don't think it's confusing, actually. I think it's unbearable. If, if your family is being butchered by Hamas or bombed by Israel, I think it's unbearable to, to look at it in the round and to realize that you are actually condoning the killing of civilians, the killing of children, because you think it is necessary. And you might even be right. But the babies don't know what they are, do they? They don't know whether they're Palestinian or Jewish or Israeli or Muslim. They've got no idea. Until the adults tell them. It's quarter past 11. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.17 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And I think the conversation has moved, hasn't it, into a space where we are essentially debating whether or not the, much of the world, much of the Western world, with so far the exception of Ireland and no doubt some others, but uh, I haven't got the linguistic skills to, to examine. Speaking of which, I, I, a few people have sent me a leaflet which purports to be the one being dropped in Gaza before the so-called ground surge. Um, I don't have the, I haven't seen it yet from a source that I know to be completely reliable. So if you've got it, you know, Reuters or someone like that, I, then I'd love you to send it to me at Mr. James OB on, on Twitter. Loads of pictures. It look, I mean, I, listen, if, I, if, if it was a simple matter of placing a bet, I'd say this looks completely authentic to me. But uh, and, and, and some of the uh, accounts set sharing it seem to be um, uh, uh, reputable, but none that I fully recognize. So I'll, I'll just hold off. I'll hold off on that for now. But the conversation, I think, is um, is moving into the, 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 the question about um, international humanitarian law, isn't it? And a, a, a sense that Israel is being encouraged to breach it or permitted to breach it by some of the rhetoric coming from western leaders uh not least of course the the, the sending of um 
uh, arms and, and, and support, not warships technically, I've been told by a couple of Royal Navy veterans. I, I read it from, from newspaper reports, but, but I understand what you mean. There are definitely Royal Marines going, so I, I think you can say military support. I don't know whether it's pedantic or not to pick up on <laughs> the phrase warships, but I'm happy to share your view, your view that it is. 90 minutes after 11 is the time. Um, I need these today, actually. I, I don't know why, but I do. Uh, you're the only person I've heard talking like a decent human being. Uh, I don't believe in God, so I simply thank you uh, for being here. Um, and Duncan, thank you for that, Jonathan. And Duncan in Warrington says, if the BBC ever needs a lesson on impartiality, they should look no further than the way you are handling this morning's conversation. Thank you, uh, Duncan. That's very kind. Although Michelle Hussain elsewhere this morning was an absolute doyen of, of, of proper inquisiting when dealing with the ludicrous ludicrous situation of Grant Shapps being Secretary of State for Defence. That's, I suppose that's Brexit Britain for you, isn't it? Um, back to this question. I, I, I mean, it, it looks as if, to me at least, the conversation everyone's frightened of having is the one that Gerard Baker kind of flirts with in the Times today, and it is saying to Israel, yep, on you, on you go. Don't worry about international humanitarian law. And the, and the chilling line in that, that article is this one. For the rest of us, it is a time for silence. It is a time for silence. How can it be a time for silence? I could be misreading it. I could be misunderstanding it. Uh, Bulama is in Lambeth. Bulama, what would you like to say? No, thank you for taking my call, James. Uh, to start with, uh, I mean, there is nothing confu confusing in your conversation. Uh, your position is very clear. This conversation is very important, timely, and it is future-sighted. Thank you. Um, but, I mean, uh, the lady talks about warning, 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 as if if someone was warned and he's civilian, then that makes uh, their life legitimate or makes them permissible target. Yes. And James, you and I are in London. I wonder if we were given 24-hour notice to leave our homes with our families, whether we, if we have not been rendered homeless, if... Uh, bombs are going to be rained, then I don't know where we are going to live to. I mean, uh, I mean to the point that warning is being given. Where, where are these people expected to go? It, it feels like a fig leaf, doesn't it? It feels like something that has been offered to people sympathetic to Israel's cause that allows them to avoid the full the full impact of what is coming. It allows them to I mean, avoid avoid having to having to articulate support for everything that follows. They, they can claim, and, and I think I would need to claim this if I was in their position, but they can claim that they, they didn't support this happening because the people that it's happened to could have got out of the way. Yeah, they were warned, and, and uh, so it is essentially then used as a justification. But if you looked at it, if those of us in London cannot leave our homes with our families, in, in, in 24 hours, what more of one of the most congested areas of the world? Mm. Um, and we know that bombs have been dropped and some of the roads have already been blocked. And if, if bombs are raining, are you safer to stay in your home or should you be rushing into a pickup or to start walking to, a part, uh, to, to nowhere? And so, I mean, I, I just don't understand the point of warning. Uh, what does that kind of warning mean? Well, the IRA, uh, of course, used to issue warnings as well. They used to phone warnings in. So whether or not that somehow means that victims of IRA bombings, I think Omar, Sally, reminds me, had had phoned warnings. The victims of those atrocities somehow don't don't count in the way that non non-warning atrocities do i don't i don't get it either it's possible balama that we're both missing something of course and that yeah yeah, yeah. It's, po it's possible but what you mentioned there i, I mean Elari, i remember that uh, boko haram also does want uh, community members to live before they attack as if uh, if they attacked after those kinds of warning then those who are killed should be blamed for 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 not uh, fleeing and uh, james if you oh. give a warning except if you are able to uh, isolate uh, Hamas from that warning, I mm. would think that Hamas would have more equipment and more ways of exiting the area before the attack. But well, that's the, the other bit that's, I think, confusing is the kindest word I can think of, is that all of the civilians flee and all of the terrorists stay behind waiting for the bombs to drop. I don't understand that logic in that <laughs> element of this. Uh, yeah, it doesn't make sense at all. I mean, I just wanted to uh, I mean, make three quick points, if yes, I may. Yes, of course, please do. Uh, yeah, the first goes to your main thesis, which is around whether the Western world has given 
carte blanche to Israel. And I think essentially, if you looked at the statement of uh, uh, quite a few of Western leaders, you can conclude. Uh, for example, Rishi Sunak said Israel has an absolute right to defend itself. Yes. There is never an absolute right to self-defense. I, my PhD is in laws of war. I am a lawyer in Nigeria and in the UK. And except uh, from Richie Sunak, I have never had the absolute right to self-defense. The right to self-defense is always conditional. It is always qualified. In law, there are three essential conditions that must be met in any right to self-defense. But Richie Sunak said absolute right to self-defense. Kirstama who is supposed to be a distinguished lawyer, came on Nick Ferrari and essentially supported collective punishment, which he knows very well that is, uh, uh, I mean, is absolutely forbidden in law. Yeah. And President Biden is uh, spreading disinformation on social media. And of course, we have had um, the Israeli pr- Prime Minister Netanyahu saying he is going to reshape the Middle East. And so... It is essentially a blank check, a cut blanche that was given to Israel to do whatever they want to do. A few politicians did mention uh, that uh, they, they need to be proportionate. And then we spent the week uh, with shows after shows questioning why they should mention proportionality. Yes. What, uh, how can you even mention, pro, um, uh, I mean, major propo- uh, proportionality as if they invented the word. <laughs> proportionality wasn't invented by them. Uh, it is contained in the 1949 Geneva Convention on the Laws of War. That convention was promulgated, was made one year after Israel was established, and that convention has been signed by all countries of the world. And in that convention, it is very clear that the doctrine of proportionality applies in every single situation of war. Israel has declared war. It has said that this has become a war, not a special operation. And by that declaration, then the Geneva Convention automatically applies. And the doctrine of proportionality is straightforward. It says where you are targeting a military target, but the civilian uh, damage as a result of that targeting, where it is going to be excessive, then you should not go ahead. And so it is a question of how many civilians are you willing to kill uh, in order to uh, target a Hamas, uh, Hamas terrorist, for example. Now, you spoke about the 447 children that were killed, but there are another 300 women that have been killed and targeting or killing women women in a situation of war is forbidden. And then, of course... They, 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 they wouldn't have been targeted specifically, would they? No, they wouldn't, but indiscriminate attack is also forbidden in situations of war. And okay. this is in a classic case of indiscriminate targeting of uh, uh, indiscriminate attacks. And the point I was going to make, James, was yes. that we talk about the women and children, about 700 of them that were killed, but of the 800 men that were killed... How many are Hamas fighters? Yeah. I mean, and I am mentioning this so that we remember that killing civilians, even when they are adult men, is not allowed in the situations of war. The final point uh, has to do with uh, something that is beyond law or humanitarian consideration or human rights. Uh, Boko Haram, uh, James, um, started in my backyard, and I have spent the last 15 years or so studying the group. Okay. A United Nations report that was published in 2017 found that of Boko Haram fighters who joined the group after the war had started, 71% joined because of human rights abuses by state forces against them. 71% of the fighters. Why am I saying this? If you went into uh, Gaza and unleashed horror on the, horror on the people of Gaza what you may end up doing is killing mass civilians. And I would hope and think that as the, at the moment, most Gazans would not do what Hamas did. But if you kill them is in large numbers, then the only Gazans that you would leave would be people whose life mission would be to prevent what you did on their families. And so you would end up strengthening Hamas because a mass casualty in Gaza is going to facilitate recruitment and a new generation of young people whose mission will be to take revenge will then, uh, will then grow up. And uh, unfortunately, we might see something even deadlier in the future. 
And so I don't think uh, going into Gaza and uh, conducting uh, indiscriminate uh, operation is going to help the situation. If Israel's uh, mission is to uh, ensure peace in its country, I think it is better for them to pursue a different approach than going into Gaza and uh, committing what you and I fear. <sighs> I, I cry, crikey, I could listen to you all day. Actually, I, I mean that that that, that the, the the concise nature of your analysis is quite inspiring to me, Balama. Thank you. No, thank you, thank you, James. Thank you for are this you, very are, important conversation. Are, yeah. are, are you Balama Bukati? Yes, I am. <laughs> Crikey. So your book Inside Boko Haram, I think, is, is, is out next year, right? Yes, it's out next year. Thank you. No, thank you. I, I, I think people listening will be very unsurprised to learn that you're, you're a, um, a world authority on some of the issues that you've just touched on. So I'm very grateful to you for calling in today. No, thank you. Thank you for oh, this you. very important conversation. Crikey. Well, thank you. It is half past 11. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.34 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. So I, I, I don't know that there is as much dispute as you might expect, actually. And I, I think the next two calls may prove it. But a, but a quick word on the last one, which um, really has uh, inspired an awful lot of people listening, the, the, the quality of that analysis and that legal knowledge and the reference to the, to the Geneva Convention, of course, which I, I think, was, was it not written pretty much, I think, the year after the modern state of Israel was founded? Um, uh, and the, the, the reference to the... Uh, precedent for this kind of response to a terrorist atrocity acting as a recruiting sergeant for for terrorists is pretty hard to fault any of Balama's logic but but I I think you know if if I'm not even going to talk about people in Israel if I was a Jew living in London and my kids school was shut today because they are fearful for their own safety from people who sympathize with Hamas then I would I, I, I could imagine being fairly supportive of anything that Israel does now in pursuit of Hamas, even if even if my soul curdles at the thought of it, the, 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 the notion of being broadly supportive of it is not impossible to understand. That's all, I think. Nasira is in Watford. Nasira, what would you like to say? Uh, good morning, James. Hello. So I've, I've, I completely agree with the previous caller. And he mentioned most of the things I wanted to speak about. Uh, the thing I wanted to <laughs> I'm just going to tease you because everyone needs a smile. You, you, so you've come on after one of the best callers I've ever yes. had on this program. Yes. And, and you're saying, oh, I was going to say all that as well. <laughs> not, not, not all of it, but some no, of it. I, I hear you. Carry um, on. <laughs> yes. I, what I wanted to say is that I think Israel is using the excuse of saying um, we're telling them to move before we attack as uh, an excuse for the killing or the mass killing that will happen to the civilians. Um, because if they move, then they bombard the area and then tell them to come back. Where are they going to come back to? If they stay, uh, then they're going to be killed. And the other thing is that Hamas is not a building that they're going to target. They are people. So the people, if they are targeting Hamas, how can they guarantee that these people are not going to move with the with the normal that's uh, a bit i don't understand I, I i mean i i suppose you could argue that it's going to take out infrastructure and hamas bases and and some of the tunnels that are used i'm a bit behind the curve on this leaflet actually it is it is it's already been verified and it says in arabic but it, it's been translated for your safety you must leave your homes immediately and go to shelters the idf is not interested in harming you or your family members anyone who is near hamas terrorists or terrorist targets will put their lives in danger but, but then you reflect upon what a, what a tiny territory it is and how closely packed it is. And you know that since between Saturday and yesterday, 6,000 bombs containing 4,000 tonnes of explosives have already fallen. So I, at the very least, it's possibly over-optimistic to think that this warning is going to be very effective. Yes, and, and, and the other thing is the support of all Western countries. Um, well, not Ireland, so in, actually. So. No, not Ireland, yes. But, uh, for example, uh, Britain sending support, military support. I thought that Israel had one of the best uh, military forces in the world. I don't know why 
uh, Britain has to send... Uh, well, because they are keen to prevent escalation. So, so we've sent two ships that are essentially support vessels joining an American aircraft carrier in, in, the, um, uh, in the area, which is partly to prevent an escalation and, and other other people getting involved. So I think there's there's an intellectual defense of that that, that doesn't yes. extend to kind of guns, although Royal but, Marines but, but are going in, 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 in one way, they're giving them a green light by allowing war crime, by stopping water and electricity. And on the other hand, they're saying we're trying to stop escalation. So for me, the two don't go together. The other thing I want well, to Well, that is, it, it, again, I, I think that Leo Varadkar has made this point, the Irish Taoiseach, it is hard to see the deliberate cutting off of, of, of supplies as, as not being collective punishment. That, that probably would constitute some sort of breach of international humanitarian law were it ever to come to trial. Yes, um, and the, the last point I wanted to make is that I'm, I'm pro- civilians but especially palestinians because for decades they have been slaughtered and killed and children being taken to prisons and people being in prison without any sentencing um that their associates so i'm sure you've heard that france banned i'm, I'm french so france banned any protest pro-palestinian yes um I'm, I'm, I'm fed up of all the news. And I've, be, I've been trying not to listen to all the news in the UK and not just in the UK, but associating every person who supports Palestinian with being supporter of Hamas. Is so they a, associate a, all pro-Palestinian to being terrorists. And it is a gross conflation. It's a, it's a gross conflation. And I think in many cases a deliberate one. Yes, but the problem is for example, as as you said before, just before I spoke, that um, Jewish people are um, their, their kids are being afraid and their school are being closed. I'm yeah. Muslim. I'm I'm afraid of putting a Palestinian flag. I'm afraid of having uh, a mark of showing support to Palestine. I'm afraid that if I go on the train to a, to a protest, that somebody is going to say something to me or do something to me. So. The, the the worry that is the, the the Jewish community is emphasizing and saying they are worried for the safety, which I I don't I don't doubt maybe no. it is true, but they need to think of the people who are pro Palestinians. Are we not worried about our? They say oh freedom of speech and freedom of speech and France is banning protests and now the UK is saying oh maybe. If you if you if you wave a Palestinian flag, then you are supporting of Hamas. Then you are labelled as a terrorist or supportive of terrorists. And I think this is completely unfair and completely deliberate. So people are scared to speak up. So uh, I, I, I say to my kids, don't, don't, don't. Uh, well, I at believe school, because I, obviously children are children. Yes. Don't even open the topic of uh, what's happening in the news because whatever you say, it may be twisted and then because we're Muslim and because we're pro-Palestinian, that, that you're going to be labelled as uh, a terrorist uh, or having terrorist views or well, being I, I, I don't know whether or you will, I don't know whether you will like this, but, but actually I suspect the experience for, for, for you and the Jewish mother giving advice to her children at the moment is probably more similar to each other than it is to the rest of us. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure it is which the is same. Which is sort of an ultimate irony, really, isn't it? When you think about yeah, it. Yeah, but 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 the thing is, people need to stop putting people who are pro-Palestinians labelled as well. It, pro I, I, and, and then, of course, it, it, well, you're right. But I mean, and you're right in the context of of flags and language and protests. But it but it is, of course, much more serious than that because, in some ways, the justification of what Israel is doing and will do hinges upon a similar conflation that, the, the, you know, uh, the, the, to, to get Hamas, you go into Gaza. And as this chap in the Times writes today, it, it, innocent people will die. And, and in order to make that more palatable, you probably don't try hard enough to draw the distinctions between the actual terrorists and the completely blameless uh, civilians, uh, uh, roughly half of whom are children in that territory, who who will die in the process. Thank you, Nasira. Uh, Eleven forty-two is the time. Leon is in Enfield. Leon, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, Hello, thanks man. for taking my call. Hi, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where do I start? It's such a such a 
a, a topic that uh, really divides. But um, there's been a broad consensus today, just just on the simple question of whether or not the the, the conversation, at least, has reached the point where everyone kind of recognises that Israel is being whether you think it's the right thing for Israel to do or not, there is mm. there is a sense that the international humanitarian law has, is, is kind of being suspended. Well, I mean, I, I disagree with that. Um, every time I've heard... But in, even, just in the know, context the of, 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 yeah. of collective punishment, then. Okay, so, I mean, firstly, Israel needs to look to the future, right? And I think the, old, the whole world is looking to the future of the Middle East, the situation. That picture, the picture of the future, has to be without Hamas. When I say without Hamas out of the picture, I mean, I'm not talking about in future, sitting at the table, discussions about uh, solutions. When I say out of the picture, they need to be disarmed, destroyed, dis member this whatever the word has to be mm. it, they have to be out of the picture in the same way that the u.s said we're not going to go and talk to al-qaeda after 9-11 we're going to i mean president bush's words we're going to smoke them out mm. we're going to take them out we're not talking to them the same way the world has come together well, you know the taliban to get rid are currently of in charge in afghanistan oh yeah that's the taliban I'm talking about Al-Qaeda. Okay. Al-Qaeda has disappeared, right? Effectively. Okay, there's this small splinter probably, groups. Probably been as, subsumed. Maybe. More than correct. disappeared. Okay. Now, the question here for Israel is what do they do? And they've said, we're going to take out Hamas, right? That's their, that, that's their aim of this war. Okay? Now... What I was going to say is that if we look at the, the strategy of the last 15 years of Israel, right, when, when I say 15 years, I mean when Hamas, since they violently took control over Fatah and took control of Gaza, their aim has always been just to build up their weaponry, infiltrate, fire rockets, etc. We've gone through that history. So I, 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 I don't want to run out of time, so, and, and I, I, okay. I, I appreciate what you're saying, but I'm just going to push you back to the central question. I don't think there's much dispute that there's certainly a case for arguing that collective punishment has already been imposed, but your view okay. is that that's justified by the necessity of, of, of dismembering Hamas. On, on the collective punishment, firstly on the siege, the, I've seen that there is some argument to say that if the siege is temporary, it's justified. So Israel has said the siege will stay in place until mm. the hostages They're are not, not Not under international law. You, you can't say, no, I promise to stop breaking the law soon. Therefore, I'm not breaking the law. No, 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 we no. We both know it's that. Saying, it's, it's, saying, it's saying that under international law, there is, there is legitimacy to do something like that. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know if you are. But, no, but, 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 you know, but Balama was. The... the, the gentleman who was talking to me just before half past yeah, 11 quite talk, quite a, yeah. a well respected in, international lawyer who's and, and I'll just this is the final point who whose studies of Boko Haram have persuaded him that this kind of response is actually the greatest ever recruiting sergeant for a terror movement like Hamas so I understand everything you've said but there must be a little scintilla of fear for you Leon that this will oh, actually is. make Hamas much stronger oh, there is. There, and, there is a fear, and any, any well. uh, pretty much anyone who survives the coming attacks is more likely to be sympathetic to Hamas than they were before they started. Yeah, but that's why Hamas has to be destroyed. And after that happens, if it does happen, the international but Hamas is just people. Come in. Hamas is yeah, just people. No. Yeah, but that's why the international so you can't destroy yeah, all the people. But they need to be they need to be disarmed, disabled. And then, then you can talk about um, some Civil, kind of coalition of the international and, and, community. And I think it would be unfair of me not to ask you this question. How many civilian deaths are acceptable in pursuit of that end? Very, very difficult question. Any civilian loss is just it, it, it's horrendous, right? I know you talked about... Well, hang on, I'm um, going to push you a bit to answer it. Okay. We're, up, we're up to, I think, nearly 2,000 already. What, what, what would be too many? Okay, look. 447 children. Let's just 
just do children it's then? It's, it's something that if, if Hamas is not removed now, this will happen again and again. So and how again. many? How many is too many? I know that's a bit glib of me, but I am interested no. if you can answer it, because I don't think I could I in your position. I, I, can't answer, I can't answer a number. I can't answer a number. But that, but and that means that, that kind of translates the... as infinity, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. So, no, the, no, no, so no, what's too many? Not. What's too many? Definitely then? not. Look, one is too many. One is too many. Well, we're already up but, to 447, but, yeah, but you're know, still but approving of the so, policy. So at what point well, what do you stop approving of I'm, the policy? I'm approving of the policy because this will prevent future yeah, problems. Yeah, and, and that's why and I'm, pushing, I'm pushing you to the point, because I disagree with you about that. I found, I, I, I found but, well, I found Balama's analysis to be more historically rooted than, than your points yeah, about I mean, Al-Qaeda and ISIS because of the geographical location and the, and, the, and the tightness of the of the territory. It's not like a moving international force in the way that Al-Qaeda was or, or in the way that ISIS was. Hamas is very neatly and tightly okay. concentrated okay. in one corner okay. of the world, <laughs> like Boko Har- 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 Haram. So he sees it as a recruiting sergeant, this, this, ter- this, this tactic. So you're Israel. saying the alternative is to do nothing? No, and then I'm not, I'm not here to provide team. alternatives. I'm here to ask you questions. Okay. And the question okay. is, okay. how okay. many okay. how many children is too many? Uh, one is too many. But we're already but up to 447. Stop. Yeah, but, but, you know, if you stop now at 447, yeah. in two years' time, you're going to have another... So, another, how, another so, so, so what, I, I, have, it's not fair of me. Explain. It's not fair explain. of me. But you... No, I can't, because we're, we're out of time. But you, you, there is no limit, is there? There is a limit. What is it? Yes. I can't, I can't answer the limit, but... It, okay, it, but there's definitely it, 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 a limit. His, just, his, his bullet, of course there is, but okay. his bullet will just come in and, and get involved if, if Israel it, does nothing to Hamas. No, and that, another, again, you're, you're and, moving and away from, and I, I listen, I do the same. If you were asking me this question, I'd be desperate yeah. to, to move the conversation into, into other yeah. territory, but we'll just leave it there. There is definitely a limit, but you can't say what it is. Yeah. Okay, okay. it's 11.49. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.52. Mick makes a point that quite a few people have made. Um, If the UK had adopted Israel's retaliation policy in Northern Ireland in the 1970s, do you think the troubles would have been over sooner, he asks, because I don't. And uh, I don't think I do either, actually, Mick. 11.53. Is the time a little more of this? I haven't decided yet what we what we'll do after twelve o'clock, but um, it takes a toll. These conversations take a toll. You, you, you're talking about dead children. You're looking at pictures of what Hamas did in Israel last weekend, and you're in your national over your breakfast now, and and uh, you know you, you you can be as thick-skinned as you want, but if it doesn't affect you, there's something wrong with you. And 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 yet again, we come back to this question of whether or not we're now embarking upon a, 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 a period of escalation that will be worse than what has gone before. In, well, it will be. In, the, in terms of the simple body count, the casualty count, it will be worse. So how does that make things better? Jason's in Belsize Park. Jason, what would you like to say? James, hi. Yeah, I guess I, I just want to add, look, I think the question is very troubling. Of course it is. And I think you've tried to reflect it very fairly i think you know one answer there's many answers one answer is um you know how many is too many perhaps an answer is as few as possible another you know another challenge to this question perhaps is one you could apply to any conflict anywhere in the world you know how many lives reflect the validity of that conflict and i guess the answer might be different Depending on the context of that conflict, and that's why this question. And depending on the comes a little on the end game as well, though. And when you have, you know, I, I mean, the Second World War is a very unhelpful example because it was a clear, or at least in hindsight, a clear battle between good and evil. But you know what the objectives of a military campaign are, and 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 you know how plausible those objectives are, and and that I that's think right. is why this is actually uniquely troubling, rather than something that can be slotted well, into questions so, throughout the ages. <laughs> perhaps the most troubling because there's two different lenses already to that question and the third which is perhaps the most prominent at the moment is you know does it does it deliver the strategic intent and everybody you know i dare say the majority of all of us myself included are probably least informed as to strategic you know military objectives in the best way but of course you know there are narratives that resonate yes of course you know further killing in the cycle that we can see over the last decade i guess the point i wanted to make was accountability mm. uh, and i feel like you know apologies up front i missed Bilal's call and clearly it was a very strong one okay but i heard that lady from israel that rang and you could 
of course, hearing her voice and, you know, something uh, I am Jewish and, and sympathetic to an awful lot of that narrative. There is an, yes. there is an existential fear, you know, that the troubles of last weekend, the, the, atro- the atrocity of last weekend is the closest, I think, in modern day history that Jews have woken up and suddenly seen, you know, or triggered or felt sentiment aligned to that of the Holocaust, a, a very existence yes. being challenged. And then you move forward just five days and the entire focus of the world and the narrative is on to how can Israel and, and now be accountable for the reaction. And so they have to be accountable for that trauma mm. and how they deal with that trauma and those feelings. And those feelings in the context, I think you've reflected very well, are unique in in the most disturbing way but then they have to make sense of what is a terribly complicated and and you don't need it is fairly obvious gaza and you know the the the, those civilians and the innocent that live within there of which it is almost all outside of hamas and the terrorists are desperately probably the weakest stakeholder in this entire conflict And yet Israel are being asked to be accountable for them. And so the challenge, and I'm not saying there isn't an obligation, and that's where you've heard it so many times on these calls, you know, give us that lady from Israel begged you for an alternative, and and rightly so. You, you, You know, who knows what that alternative is? But without that, they face an existential threat. So they, so we feel our survival is being threatened. But at the same time, we're being told we can't do things. That, that isn't an option. <laughs> you know, what is an option? And, and you could start to challenge that in some difficult ways. And you talk about the international community and many callers come on and want to, you know, call the, inter- the international community to task around holding Israel to task. When perhaps that could be challenged a different way. You know, the, the spiritual head of Hamas sits in Qatar. Or so it is reported, living a fairly lavish lifestyle, so it is reported. Mm. Why is that okay to the international community if we are talking about strategic objectives and trying to minimize casualty and not wanting to put the entire onus on on the group of extremely traumatized victims that have, are only five days into, you know, their second worst atrocity in living memory? It might be that maybe the focus needs to take that pressure away from Israel being accountable on all sides. I've, you know, why aren't there bunkers? Why, and, and we understand that. Why aren't there bunkers? Because Hamas did not give any of the money, the billion dollars that Qatar gave to them, the quarter of a the, billion. But you Obama know, the, le- the leaflets are telling people to go into the non-existent bunkers. And those leaflets 100%. coming and, from Israel. And I guess, I guess of, of course, one, in, it, it, with the lack of alternatives, all you can do is hold yourself to but a isn't value. This, isn't, yes, exactly that, Jason. And that's, that, that's where you've just led me. Because this is actually about civilization, isn't it? That's what international correct, correct. Hu- humanitarian law is about. And correct. it does feel almost unfair that Israel is being asked to be accountable and Israel is being asked... I think asked. it's highly unfair. But highly that's, unfair. that's civilization <laughs> versus barbarism, isn't it? That, that's right. And so what, so what you're hearing is everybody screaming what they can, which is... We're doing everything we can. We are putting up a wall. People scream about the blockade. Well, there was a time not long ago when there wasn't a wall, a blockade, and it was built for a reason, because there were incursions and intifadas that were blowing up innocent civilians on the street. So that went up. They're screaming that blockade and the water and that electricity. Well, Israel don't surround Gaza. Egypt, you are keeping very yeah. quiet, and you, you challenge As always. that value. As always. Israel... And why is that? And whose interest is it for them to be quiet? And who's putting pressure into Egypt for them to be quiet? Because Israel are, again, if it didn't happen on the weekend, wouldn't be uh, uh, engaging in this conflict and having to have this discussion. But you talk about values, and this this is a, a gross hyperbole, but it's almost to reflect this. If I hyperbolize it, it's not a stretch of the imagination to think very quickly with the superior military might. Yes. Israel could probably create an, an enormous 24 hours that would solve that. If you're looking for a strategic goal of there being no more Hamas or an infrastructure, yeah. they could wipe out Gaza in two minutes, right? But there are values. And one of those values is to send in a land army. And they know, and we know, 
collectively, that that's going to bring on a further series of traumas and deaths of Israeli citizens. And those are difficult discussions where we continue to hold our hand up and say, well, we drop leaflets, we fire dummy rockets, we send in our army to try and minimize. We're not suggesting that one life is more important than the other, but we are suggesting faced with existential threat or no alternative. And at the moment, after this weekend, we feel no alternative. And, and I feel like that's at least a healthier context because there isn't an answer. So, you you know, you see it at all the calls. It doesn't matter what question you ask. And, right. you know, LBC over the last few days have been wonderful in posing and challenging and trying to be balanced. But despite the question, 90% of the callers are just saying what you've said today. You know it's an atrocity, but... And then they need to get the free Palestine. Or, or on the other side, we drop you know, dummy rockets, mm. and what more can we do? Well, that's so why the question I, is a little irrelevant. Well, I, I, yeah, well, I, I would, I mean, we could have that conversation another time, actually, because I, I put a, quite a lot of work into getting the questions right, and I like to think the quality of contributions that you've just demonstrated is a, is, is, is a consequence of getting the questions right, rather than talking about Wembley or, 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 you know, whether the BBC is using the right language. You ask questions like that, I don't get calls like yours, Jason, is, is, is my sort of very, very brief professional defense but um but you're right and and uh, and, uh, and i needed to hear what you had to say i think everybody did it's 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 a uh, it, it, it's not a zero sum game is it and although israel could be doing less it could also be doing a hell of a lot more in every sense of of, of both of those words and yeah I, I mean you know it might be a sovereign nation with an army and a navy and an air force unlike hamas and and with that come some responsibilities but the idea that you are at war with an organization that has no accountability or responsibility um, while you're expected to demonstrate so much is is unfair in the simplest sense of the word. So thank you. And, and thank you, everybody, for making that uh, two hours. Um, despite Jason's criticisms, I thought it was very, very illuminating um, and, and even at times unpredictable. It's 12.03. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. And it's 12.06. And it, it, that, that, that kind of broke me a bit, that two hours. Um, just in the sense of, 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 of trying to keep everything decent, actually. Even as Jason just beautifully crystallised at the end. Even as the bleakness becomes almost unbearable. So I am going to move on. I apologise to people waiting to contribute. We will not be... Uh, and again, th I know I normally read out Idiot's Corner. It's been the opposite today, and I, I, I am very great. I won't read out any more. Um, oh, hang on, there's one here. I suggest you ask James to listen to the last hour of his show. He may understand how biased and quite shocking his views sound. He is a dangerous individual. I'm almost grateful for that because uh, I, I was in danger of believing my own hype with all the kind words and, and compliments coming in. Not so much for me necessarily, but for... For the callers as well. I'm going to move on to something completely different. I'm going to move on to a territory that I once said you should never go near as a phone-in host. But the world has turned. I refer to Captain Sir Tom Moore and his family being in the news now for uh, keeping £800,000 raised by his books. And they were books written only as a consequence of the celebrity he achieved by becoming uh, a, an incredible fundraiser during... Lockdown, um, uh, £39 million was raised by a 99-year-old man walking up and down his garden. I'm going to say that again. £39 million was raised um, by a man walking up and down his garden. And I think the time has come now to ask what happened. How, how, how did that happen? That's all. I, I, I'm going to make a slight confession to you. I didn't really get caught up in it at the time. I have to be honest with you. It, it didn't leave me cold. It just left me benignly bemused. I thought, what a lovely old fella he is and how great that he's raising so much money. But the elevation to sainthood that happened in nanoseconds was actually quite bizarre, wasn't it? I mean, he was... Ca Normally... The Vatican goes back over your entire life. You have to find evidence of performing a miracle. 
and then there are big concaves and 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 ecclesiastical discussions before sainthood, and there there are various stages of it. You go on a list of people that are being considered for sainthood, and. I know that he wasn't actually sainted, but he might as well have been. He got knighted. He got an honorary colonelship. He, I, I presume, he met the queen. Did he? I mean, it was, he definitely did. He met the late queen. I, I mean, it was it was astonishing. And it began as a one thousand pound fundraising uh, and boredom alleviating exercise in his own back garden. I, I, I mean, I, I can't quite. Credit it now, looking back. Can you? That's going to be the phone-in, by the way. Can you credit it? So what happened? Imagine imagine if you were trying to explain this story to somebody that wasn't around at the time. So there's a family on the telly who are getting a bit of a kicking for keeping £800,000 from books that their dad wrote. Well, why are they getting a kicking? They're perfectly entitled to kick. Yeah, but he only became someone who was going to secure a book deal and that's quite a big book deal, eight hundred grand. I mean, for three books, that's 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 very, 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 very good terms. And he only got book deals as a consequence of celebrity that came about as a consequence of fundraising for the NHS. They claimed that the that Tom, Captain Tom, wanted his family to keep the children, but he did in fact write in one of them that the books would be raising cash for good causes. So there's, I mean, this isn't the phone-in, by the way, I don't think. Um, I, I, I kind of, no, I did, I, th- I think you're right, you're reminding me actually of a couple of things. I did find, I think I did find it very moving in a sense at the time, although also confusing. It was also very confusing. What I want you to do is explain to someone who slept through it all what happened? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. That's it. That's 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 all. That's all I want you to do. Why did this man capture the imagination and the affection of the nation in such? Did we speak to his grandson? Didn't his grandson ring in? I think his grandson rang in actually. When so we did talk about it at the time. That what happened? What was it about this man and this process that was so? I don't even... What's the word? Is it inspiring? Because you shouldn't really have been inspired. Well, I don't know. I genuinely don't. I cannot explain it now. And yet you're reminding me that that at the time, actually, I wasn't quite as... uh, um, uh, immune to to the... Could we call it a madness? A fever. Do you know what tulip fever was? Tulip, there's a great book about it by um, an author called Deborah Mogach. But tulip fever was just this really weird thing in Holland. I forget exactly when it was, 16th or 17th, so it may have been a bit later than that. And everyone suddenly went mad about tulips. And I think it got turned into a film, didn't it? 17th century Amsterdam. Um, the, the, the tulip suddenly started changing hands. A tulip bulb started changing hands for, for, for the price of a decent-sized home. The price of a decent sized house and and everybody got caught up in it and then suddenly it stopped and everybody was no longer caught up in it and people looked back and thought why the heck why the heck did we spend the price of a small house on a bloody tulip bulb what what was it about tom moore that touched that's the word i want that touched the nation on a scale that in retrospect is actually quite hard to believe. 03456060973 is the number that you need. That there it is. And and I don't want any um poo-pooing or or, or, or sniffing. I think that the, the the his daughter and her family are in a slightly uncomfortable situation. I don't know why they gave a, a, a television interview last night and I know there've been some uh, uh discussions surrounding the improvement to their fortunes that followed um, uh, the, the the elevation of their uh, granddad and dad to, to the sort of status he enjoyed before his death. But I don't necessarily want to look at that side of things. I think I want to look at this. I think I just want you to tell me what happened. 03456060973. And, and part of the reason we're doing this, which I grant you is not the most important conversation to be had, is because I'm, I'm, I'm shattered. Um, it's Friday, the final hour of the show together. We've done two, four, 
five, seven, eight hours on Israel and Gaza this week, and I find every minute uh, a trial. I think it's deeply important that we have these conversations. I think it is my job to ensure that we have these conversations in sophisticated ways. I, I, I use that word advisedly, sophisticated and intelligent ways. Otherwise, we become um, part of the, the, the things that I criticize, shallowness, the discouraging of thinking, knee-jerk reactions, using an atrocity such as what Hamas did last weekend as a, as a stick with which to beat your already established enemies like the BBC. I just find it pathetic. So that, that's why I work so hard, much harder than I do at normal times. And now I'm going to have a bit of a rest. Unless, of course, you don't phone me on the question of why Sir Tom Moore, Captain Tom Moore, ca captured the, touched the nation in the way that he did. Because if you don't phone me, I'm going to have to do a monologue um, on my programme. It is 12.15. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, 03456060973. Anger, as Captain Tom's family admit pocketing £800,000. Question occurring to me as a consequence of, of, of this fella's um, experiences being back in the spotlight is what, what happened? How did a man who was nearly 100 raise £39 million by walking up and down his garden in the middle of a, an unprecedented period of British history? Just give me your answers to that question. The time is 12.15. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 18 minutes after 12 is the time. I, I mean, I, th there is a slightly cynical angle to take on this as well, which is it doesn't matter what the story is. The nature of this country at the moment is eventually it will become a controversy. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it doesn't really, uh, whatever it is, uh, it, it'll be turned into a, a kind of, there's too many chat shows. I know I present a talk show and my broadcasting career began on one of the very first sort of programmes that just invited uh, uh, dubious celebrities to argue with each other on the telly every morning, but there's too much of it now. Everything's treated as an argument. You've got to get so, but and, and that I think lends itself to the desperate search for outrage or offence. And now they found it with with Captain Tom Moore's daughter, who um, trousered eight hundred thousand pounds worth of. I mean, it's not that's not the topic at the moment. It might it might bleed into that topic because it's a bit rum, isn't it? Really? But that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking how this old boy could capture the imagination of this country to such a, I, I, I nearly said ridiculous degree, but that sounds like I'm mocking it or disapproving. I'm not. I'm, part, I'm just confused in retrospect by what happened to us all, myself included. 03456060973. James is in Brittany. Uh, James, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello. Uh, well, it's it's an interesting thing. I I I was asking throughout the whole episode exactly the same question that you are, <laughs> um, and I think, I mean, to me, uh, it it goes back to a nostalgia that the I was going to say the British. I'd say the English yeah. have yeah. for the Second World War okay. and the connection. Um, most. You know, the, 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 uh, many English people have some family connection with uh, with the Second World War. People of my generation, yes. maybe even people of your generation, it could have been uncles, grandparents, all of that. And that connection is very, very important to people. And it's going, it's lost. There are very, very few living survivors mm. who fought in the Second World War. Uh, he, Tom, was one of them, and I think that's what people are grasping onto. It's almost like a personal connection with a part of the part of people's um, culture, um, heritage, all okay. of that. Yeah. Now, I I don't feel it. Didn't it. touch you, you though, you did it? Don't get it. No. And does there, do you know what the reason for that would be? What? Well, I was, I was going to. I was wondering if you'd, if you'd find it. We don't have it. We, because of our Irish heritage, we don't have this nostalgia and connection because our grandparents, for the most part, were not fighting. They weren't involved. Ireland was was uh, neutral, mm, and it's one of the. But things I think that, you're 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 you're. Um 
family history is a bit different from mine. My my, my grandparents yes. were here. My, yes, uh, my granddads were both yes. in protected professions. They could easily have gone to war. One was a copper and one was working in a steelworks in Sheffield. So it was, I don't know. I, and also, I wasn't untouched by it. I shouldn't I shouldn't have given that impression. I kind of misremembered a bit. Because I, I, I wouldn't say I'd be embarrassed by getting caught up in it. But the, the, it just... It just, it was more than, so actually Sally tallies with you, James. She's written, I can tell you now that my granddad walking up and down his garden without any medals and without a daughter working in brand development would not have garnered any hearts at all. So there was possibly something <laughs> a bit cynical going on below the surface. I'm not sure. But you're right. Mm. The, 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 I mean, there aren't many left, are there? Well, there weren't mm. many left that had seen mm. action in that war. And, and he was representative of that and if you think maybe that subconsciously james the message is well we got through that so we'll get through this yeah, possibly possibly but i think uh, i mean as you know someone i live in i live in france now and, and had a strong connection with france for, for 30 40 yes. years and there this uh, still obsession with the second world war yeah. is absolutely bizarre as looked looked at from outside. The, interestingly, I was watching, I sometimes watch GBBs uh, okay. just to see what was being said. Yes. And I, I was watching it yesterday. And, you know, throughout, the, there were news reports on what's happening in, in, uh, in what has happened in Israel, Israel what yeah. is happening or likely to happen in Gaza. And they had an advert and it was for, I think, a magazine or little models of British bombers. <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, you pay your, you know, one of these part part work uh, things where you no, know, you're, you're right. Uh, yes, there is a, there, there, I, it is still very very much yeah uh, yeah uh, yeah that's got to be a big part of it, and and that's why the medals were relevant and the rank. If it had been, I got quite a rude message, um, funny rude, not 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 nasty rude, but I think I've lost it now. Um, about if it was my if it was my next door neighbour Sid wandering up and down the back garden with a two litre bottle of cider in his hand, nobody would have known. So, so they did capture. Uh, I don't know how much of that. I didn't even know his daughter had a background in brand management. How did how did it? Do we know how it happened? Was it a newspaper got involved? Was it presumably a local paper turned up? And then there was so little news around. Do you remember how little news there was? We talked about the pandemic every day for what felt like twenty five years. So there was so little news around. I bet that. So there's two questions here. There's the the. I don't want to say the madness, the feverish nature of the public response, but there's also what happened news wise. I think it's because there was hardly any news. All there was was uh, so many people have died, or so many people have got it, or we're closing this and closing that. So you've got a weird streak of patriotism or or, or bellicose nostalgia, war nostalgia for war. Then you've got the absolute absence of news, which meant that presumably it got picked up by the local advertiser and then national newspaper journalists desperate for anything to put in the paper or, or local TV. I presume that's what happened. And then we all jumped on it. And the next thing you know, he's raised 39 million quid for the NHS and his daughter's pocketed nearly a million in um, in. Book sales, book deals, 25 minutes after 12. Thank you, James. Julie's in Enfield. Julie, what would you like to say? Um, I had an incredibly emotional response to um, Captain Tom and yes. what he was doing and the whole Well, a lot story. of people did, didn't they? Yeah, I did, but it was... And I've been sitting here trying to work out exactly <laughs> why, because it was... I felt it as soon as you mentioned him yes. again. Did you? And if I see a photo of him, it's just a really emotional response. I think that, broadly, we were all looking for hope. We were all looking for comfort. Um, personally, I was at home by myself. Yes. Um, without any family. And he did remind me of my dad. Right, a bit. I, there must have been a lot of that. Um, yeah, yeah. I the mean, older, the older a man like, gets, almost like the, yeah. the, the more similar they all start. We all start looking, I think, at some yes, point. Yes, there's definitely <laughs> an element of that. Yeah, I mean, at the time, I'll be, I, I, I listened to LBC before. I started listening to it every day, okay. and I thought of you as kind of Uncle James, and then there was un, um, Auntie Sheila. Oh, that's nice. And Thank you. it was like a, it was a. You know, I was I was looking for family wherever I could find it, and he reminded me of my dad. I think because there was a military connection, because he was very cheeky. Mm. Um, mm. I saw him flirting with um, I, I can't remember if it was an interviewer or something he said about a nurse. 
Uh, with the medals, it made me think of the Remembrance Day parade that I'd attended with my dad and how much that meant to my dad. Yeah. There was um, a lot going on, wasn't there? Yeah. Yeah, there was, yes. Yes. Um, Whether we realised it or not, and I, I don't know, we won't be able to measure this, but I wonder how much of it was. There was nothing else around. No, there wasn't. It, was, it intrigued me, the things that did take our attention. Mm. Um, I, Oliver Mabel, the dogs, that was a massive thing. What was that? I've forgotten that, that was, I still, I still, it was a, a sports commentator um, who started commentating on his uh, two Labradors. Oh, um, lovely. Which one was it? Can you um, remember? I can't remember. Can you remember it? I don't really watch sports. I can't Well, you weren't watching sports, you prune. Name. You were watching Labradors. Yes, I was watching. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, I can't remember the guy's name because he's not somebody I'd ever encountered. Oh, I see, I'm sorry. That's, that's why it's I relevant think. that you don't watch sport that's much because you didn't know yeah, who he yeah, was, yeah, but yeah, it popped yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. I, 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 need, I didn't yeah. realize. I didn't feel appropriate for us at the time, Julie, to, uh, to, to 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 look for stuff that wasn't about COVID. But actually, in a way, that wasn't about COVID. It was about a lovely old boy and and memories of our granddads and our dads and and the war and medals and and. Um, it was a scam, writes Paul, exploiting a vulnerable old man. Paul, don't, come on. It certainly wasn't anything like that. The 29 million, 39 million quid went to the NHS. You can't argue with that. But I admit that 800,000 pounds, not from any charity donations, um, going to... Well, hang on a minute. Thank you, Julie. Um, I, I'm just imagining it was me, right? I'd, highly unlikely for a number of reasons, not least the fact that I'm nowhere near 100, I haven't got any medals, and I've never fought in a war. But if I somehow became a figurehead for fundraising and succeeded to the tune of nearly £40 million and Penguin came along and said, would you like to write your autobiography? Why wouldn't I be in charge of where that money went? I wonder whether we've been a bit unfair on the family on that front. I don't know. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't. Well, anyway, we shall see. It was Andrew Cotter, I'm told, was the journalist who was uh, the rugby commentator who was um, providing commentary. That passed me by, I think, at the time. Although it's a bit of a memory hole that whole period. Actually, it it is a bit of a memory hole, isn't it? It was not it, the things you can't remember until someone reminds you. And I'd forgotten his grandson rang into the program. I thought we'd never gone near this as a as a conversation because it it seems so strange. But I'm being re I'm being assured by lots of you that I, I I was completely caught up in it, just just as everybody else was. I can't tell you why, and that's the point of this phoning. Tim Humphries is here now with your headline. James O'Brien on LBC. <laughs> James O'Brien on LBC. It is 33 minutes after 12. It is, I mean, I, I, I thought that Julie's call was particularly interesting. You're sort of still feeling it now uh, because I, I, I'm, I, I'm finding it a little hard to remember what it was that moved us all so much in the context of um, uh, 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 Captain Tom Moore, Captain Sir Tom Moore, Colonel Captain Sir Tom Moore, Saint Colonel Captain Sir Tom Moore. I, I mean, we could go on. And, and of course, he became a receptacle, didn't he? Because walking up and down your garden, even if you're very old, it's not that, it's not that impressive. It's not that big a deal. So he became a receptacle for something. He became whatever we wanted him to be. We were putting things in him that, that, uh, that, that were about where we were, the war and our granddads and our fathers. That, that's the thing. It, it really does not make any sense at all. Diane is in Southampton. Diane, what would you like to say? Hi, it's uh, the first time I've phoned in. But well, welcome. Better asked, late than never, when, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> when you asked the question, yes. um, I thought, I, I think I know what that was for me. And yes. then listening to the previous caller about that emotional response, that kind of um, also solidified what I was thinking. Yeah. Is that in that context, we were all at home in our gardens, if we were lucky enough to have one, yes. a lot of people on their own banging pots and pans and dress desperately trying to make a connection uh, with other people. Um, but also in the context of a lot of our older generation were really, really suffering at that time. They were isolated uh, even more than most of us, extremely vulnerable. A lot of them were dying and dying alone. And he became kind of representative of that generation. Yeah. And we were also all concerned about the NHS and about the staff 
and their ability to cope. And it, it just joined those things together uh, as a kind of symbol for what we were going through at the time, I think. And, and so, I mean, in a way, he was just in the right place at the right at the at the right time, wasn't he? In a sense, because it, it, yeah. it and it somehow. So, what was it about the walking up and down the garden that captured us? Or is that irrelevant I, to the story? It was I, just. I think it's you know whatever he'd have been doing. Whatever propelled him into the simple. news. It, it yeah. wasn't about what propelled him into the news. It was about what we thought he was when he ended up in the news. Yes, and what he represented, I think, for us at that time. It was like it was like a human embodiment of the keep calm and carry on posters that were popular a few years ago, wasn't he? Yes, and I think also um, around that time, the Queen had made a speech, hadn't she, saying we will meet again. And and that was part of evoking that sort of bygone era where we're all yes. in it together and, um, you Blitz know, spirit. we'll overcome all this. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I thought it I was. I think that's was beautifully that put. It was a representation. I know, I like that. So why, why have you never rung me before? Um, well, normally because um, <laughs> I'm driving, which I Fair was, enough. but I have managed to pull over. Well, thank I'll you, Diane. I'll you again. I look forward to <laughs> I'll, it. I'll get more political next time. I can't wait. I, there you go. I don't think there's much prospect of politics coming in too hard on this particular conversation, except, of course, to say that the government were making such a pig's ear of everything that seeing Captain Tom as a survivor of the Second World War was a reminder that this too shall pass, perhaps. I don't know. Drive carefully, Diane. 12.37 is the time. Um... The, oh, someone takes that point here. Uh, Will in Brighton. Major Tom touched the nation. He's not Major Tom. That's ground control, mate. That's David Bowie. That's, that's, uh, but, but Captain Tom touched the nation because we've all lost faith in the capacity of the Tories and the NHS to look after us. I hadn't. I, I mean, we were clapping on our doorsteps every Thursday for the NHS, mate. What are you on about? Uh, his appeal was that his actions were the obverse of the callous cruelty of modern laissez-faire capitalism. If you say so, Will. If you say so. For me says James in Ramsgate. Captain Tom was the nation's granddad, playing the piano in the strangest manner. That, I added that, not him. He seemed completely honest, kind, thoughtful and selfless. Maybe he seemed like what we all want to be. Oh, that's very nice as well. And Mark in Epson says, Remember, James, we thought at the time that we might be stuck in lockdown for years. We thought it might be our lives forever. Captain Tom tapped into our already on the edge emotions and like the last remaining grown up in the country told us that everything would be all right in the end. I think there's some truth in that. Um, here it is, the one I couldn't find earlier. Captain Tom had the gravitas of being a war veteran. If my neighbour Sid had walked up and down his garden clutching a two litre bottle of cider, nobody would have given a monkey's. I think that's probably true as well. Uh, 12.38 is the time. Pip's in Epsom. Pip, what would you like to say? I think everything that, every, everything that everyone's saying is, is, is all correct. It all factors in. I, th I think we've begun to forget, thank God, the insane levels of everything that we were going through, insane level yeah. of anxiety about everything. And also, I think it's a real loss of control of our lives, James. We had no control over our lives. We couldn't see anyone. That's we couldn't go true. out. Yes. W work and life and everything was disrupted. And as I said to your researcher, you know, we were, you know, the government did seem to not know what the hell to do. Yeah. Um, and he was an old man, a war veteran. We love a war veteran. We do love a war country. veteran. Yes. He, he had medals. Um, and he, he was just something I think we could control. We could contribute. We could do something towards the NHS because we all felt so flipping useless. Yes. I know we, could, we I know staying indoors was helping. I know that. But no, it didn't really I mean, feel I like I it, did it? On, you know, I was working from home, but I just think it was, it was, we all felt, thank goodness, we could do something to contribute because we all felt so out of control completely that you we for, thank goodness we've sort of forgotten forgotten oh gosh i've lost my words oh, we forgot the element of of powerlessness we had mm. and it was just so frightening yes it, yeah it, it I, I mean I, 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 to sit here four years later it was so frightening four years three years i can't even lost track uh you know we we <laughs> We couldn't go out shopping without... But none of this works. All, all, this all works. It all works and it doesn't work at all. So, uh, the, you know, if we were trying to explain it to someone who slept through the whole thing, I don't know that we'd have touched the sides yet, really, with this. And yet everything you've said makes perfect sense at the same time. I mean, that's the only reason I can think of that I actually used to watch the one show and enjoy it. <laughs> There's no need to be rude. I'm a big fan of the one show. Uh, 12.40 is the time. Uh, just a short note on Captain Sir Tom Moore from Pradeep, who says uh, Bedford Hospital have created a little garden and monument in his memory right in the in the front part of Bedford Hospital. That's nice, Pradeep. Thank you for sharing that. So if you'd slept through the whole thing, 
And now someone was explaining to you in retrospect who Captain Tom was. You'd have to say this, right? There was a pandemic. Oh, yeah, I know about the pandemic. All right, and there was a lockdown. Yeah, I heard about the lockdown. Was it as strict as you said? Yeah, seriously, you could get arrested for going to the park. Um, and, and we were all living in lockdown. And then somehow this fellow turned up who used to be a soldier. Okay, all right. He was 99, you know, or possibly 98 when it started. He was a very old soldier, captain. Okay, yeah, and what happened then? Because, well, he decided he was going to raise a few quid for his local hospital by walking up and down his garden a thousand times, was it, with his, with his frame, his walking frame. Oh, that's nice. And he became the most famous person in the country for about six months and raised £39 million for the end. Whoa, 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 whoa. just back up a bit, will you? I was, I got, because I, I, I got the bit about the garden. He was walking up and down his garden to raise a thousand pounds for his local hospital, and he was a war veteran, and he looked like everybody's idea of what an old fella should look like. He looked nice. And he had a couple of catchphrases about tomorrow being better than today or something like that, and you'll never walk alone. And and then there's this jump, isn't there? In the narrative arc, in the story. There's a leap from and there he is, off he goes, walking up and down his garden. God bless you, Captain Tom. God bless you. And and then Thirty nine million pounds and knighthoods later. I, I, that's the bit that I think you'd struggle to convey to someone who'd slept through the whole thing. Andrew's in Peterborough. Andrew, what do you reckon? I know, yes. I, I mean, I, I find it interesting you say your memory fails you to a degree because I think we all have short memories on these sort of things, yes. especially with something as extraordinary as that, because um, Let's not forget, many of us were stuck at home. Yes. Those that were working were working in extraordinary circumstances, you know, with masks and barriers between us, etc. Yes, that's true. Um, we, we, we had friends or family that were either severely ill or dying. Um, it was, an, as a previous caller said, it was an incredibly emotional time for everybody. And what Sir Tom did, he created this, he was a conduit between ourselves and the NHS. And what was mentioned earlier about his daughter being in brand marketing, I mean, it's almost as if she had a hand in it. And he, he, he was labelled a representative of the NHS. Yes. We saw, that we saw them with inappropriate PPE. Um, the government was doing very little to support them, yet they were working for us through that extraordinary time. And that, and it was an emotive um, occurrence. And everybody gave money to him because he was a great communicator. Was and he? Was he? We, 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 we wanted to give like, to the well, NHS. Well, but, but, but just back up a bit. Was he a great yeah. communicator? Well, I, I think I think so. He, he, really? he got his, he, he, well, like Stephen he got Fry is a great communicator, or, or, or yeah. Sheila Fogarty is a great Are you sure he was a great communicator? Well, well, what I'll say is he got his message across. He did. And the times that he was interviewed on the t television yeah. by local and national news, yeah. everybody listened. Everybody well, yeah. watched. And he, got, he, 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 he enthralled people. And um, I think I think it was probably something to do with his position in, in the forces. Which well, definitely. I to... like our call. Our texter said, "There's no way that if your neighbour had just done it in his tracksuit, it would have got anything like the yeah. attention." <laughs> just, what right. are you doing, Bob? Just walking up and down yeah. the garden to raise money for the local hospital, James. Oh, I'll phone the news desk. Just wouldn't exactly. happen, was it? So he needed the medal. Yeah, his position. But that sounds uh, weird uh, uh, now. Doesn't his position in, in the military, he, he had a gravitas. Well, he, well and yeah. People, but, took, people took notice of it. Yeah, but that sounds weird now, doesn't it? With, without realising it. Because now exactly. at some point in this process, Andrew, someone yeah. said to him, Oh, what are you doing, Dad? <laughs> I'm walking up and down the garden. So I'll put your medals on. What? Hey, look, excuse me. Put it you... all sounds extraordinary now. It the does. The of day it's... after the event, it's everything. It's almost, somebody mentioned, you mentioned if we'd slept, somebody had slept through it. Yeah. It's almost as if the whole thing was a dream or a nightmare. I think that's And we've woken up and we, and we say to each other, did that really happen? Well, OK. Did Captain Tom have a number one hit single with Michael Ball <laughs> during the pandemic? Yes or no? Yeah. Did he? <laughs> no, answer the question. I'm just proving your point. Is that true or false? Well, I, I think it might be true. I've got no idea. Someone just texted it to me. I don't know whether they're joking or whether it that, but it proves Andrew's point, doesn't it? Did, did he have a number one hit single with Michael Ball during the pandemic? I'm saying true. 
James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.49 is the time. I'm talking about that bizarre period of our shared history. The COVID inquiry now is, is, is looking at some of the WhatsApps that it's managed to get hold of. I can't remember, which is symptomatic, really, of the state of the media, isn't it, and the state of the nation, whether Sunak and Johnson ever actually handed over theirs. My memory says they didn't, but they've got hold of some. And they're looking at an exchange between the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, and um, Lee Kane, who was head of communications at Downing Street, one of Dominic Cummings' um, uh, key people. And this appears to suggest that it was Johnson's fiance, now wife, Carrie Simmons, who was who was running the show, as opposed to Dominic Cummings. Uh, Robert Peston, the political editor over at ITV, writes um, amazing disclosure about who the Cabinet Secretary, Simon Case, thought was really running the country. It wasn't the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, or Dominic Cummings. It was... Um, it was Carrie Simmons or Johnson. I forget when the marriage occurred to sit into the... Uh, I was always told, this is a quote, I was always told that Don was the secret per, secret PM. The real person in charge is Carrie. We look like a terrible, tragic joke. I cannot cope with this. That's the exchange. Um, and, 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 and I think this is Lee Kane replying to Simon Case. I know, and she doesn't know WTF she is talking about either. That's all coming out now. Um... So possibly given the madness that was unfolding in Downing Street, the madness that was unfolding in Tom Moore's back garden is not as baffling as it initially appeared to be. 12.50 is the time. Joe's in Windsor. Joe, what, what, what would you like to say? Oh, hello, James. I was really hoping you yeah. would keep this magical Sir Tom Moore going. We don't want to hear about Boris and his crowd. <laughs> well, you've got to. We've got You're to find really out about what, what happened. I mean, that's that's probably why, because Johnson was so awful, that's why yeah. Tom Moore appeared so... Um, whatever the yeah. word is for the opposite yeah, of awful, Joe. It's just as you said earlier, and it really kind of touched me, you said, like, you're exhausted. It's yeah. been a horrific week, hasn't it, with yeah. the news for all of us, especially for news presenters. It must be oh, really harrowing. You. Yes. And so that's why I was saying it. it was just so nice to have this little smile Bit of jolly. about the top more. Yes, you know? you're right. You're right. Um, so I was enjoying it. So try and keep it up to the top of the hour. <laughs> um, oh, well, we'll be all right. I've got a clip of Mary Beard to play in a minute from this week's full disclosure, but, uh, but, but Sheila will be <laughs> here in a minute don't worry <laughs> okay, so, so why did he capture to... why did he touch the nation in such a well, profound way do you know i was thinking i mean i was kind of picking up on what some other people were saying a yes it was emotional b it was kind of a bit of like blitz spirit and he kind of it was looking at him this gorgeous fragile but lovely old man with his medals and his pride yeah but it was a bit like the Good old days. You was know it? What say? That's nice. Oh, it was just taking. Why did he put his medals on though when he was in the back garden? <laughs> I was laughing when you were saying that. That's a bit, I'd never really <laughs> cocked that before. Put your medals on, Dad. Why am I putting my medals on? I've got to phone the local paper. About matey boy yeah. walking up and down his drive with a pint bot, bot, of two <laughs> pints of cider in a plastic <laughs> bottle, just in case. Okay, you can you you can go definitive on this one. Did he or did he not? Record a number oh, one single with Michael he Ball. Did. I'm sure he did. It was um oh it was that oh Bluebirds over was it Blue or We'll Meet Again, wasn't it? We'll Meet Again. There it is, Joe. Well, that's just ruined it because I'm not into football. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a face. It's Rodgers and Hammerstein, isn't it, originally as well? You don't have to associate it necessarily with Liverpool. I, I didn't know when Mark texted me that. I thought he was joking. And it's, I mean, I, and it, I, I, well, I have no words, really. That got to the top of the charts, apparently. The top of the hit parade. I wonder where the royalties went. That's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. Joe, Joe take care. Um, we better have a little listen. I did, I've had some lovely full disclosures lately. Uh, Susie Dent last week, still available. This week, well, they're all available. Global Player or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, 
it's an astonishing body of work now, which is a slightly pompous way of putting it. But you, because you look back over even the last ten, it's just uh, never mind the last hundred. It's it's incredible. Very very proud of it. And this was one of my favourites, Mary Beard, the historian. But of course, her career before she became a television presenter was um, was incredible, and probably something you know a little bit less about. Have a little listen to this. I I found uh, Latin and Greek. Very exciting. I also found I was good at it. Okay. And I think when you're in your early teens, um, there is a pleasure in being good at something. Yes. And and then you become better at it because yes. you invest more, yes. um, because you want to shine at it, and then you shine more. But I think it was so. There, there was a you know like you know it's a confession that it was it was because I I liked being good in that way but I, there was also an excitement about the ancient world which came not actually through reading great classical texts it came through thinking about archaeology and you know, just thinking about the I mean and I still feel this you know the sheer excitement of being able to touch the past yes. it's you know I it's wonderful. I can't imagine ever not being excited. But when did that first blossom then? When did that, where did you, because I know you did some archaeological excavations yeah. during the school holidays, which is not a normal pastime. No. Really, oh, well, you wouldn't be able to do it now. No. But, you know, back in the day, yes. you know, teenagers were allowed to go and wreck, wreck archaeological sites. <laughs> you know, but it, it started when I was very little. Did it? I mean, uh, and it, it, I, you know, I know exactly, I mean, I know and I can still remember in my head um, the exact moment when it started which was um, when I was five right and my mum had taken me to London for the first time and we went to the British Museum and I was kind of I wasn't keen on the Greeks and Romans and didn't know who they were but I was keen on the Egyptians because right. everybody's keen on yeah, mummies yeah, aren't they? Yeah. and she took me to the uh, Egyptian everyday life room and she pointed out the back of a case. There is a piece of Egyptian cake. It's three thousand years old. Blimey, you know. And I wanted to see it, of course. Of course I, yeah. uh, and back then, museums were not at all child friendly, and the cases are very high. She'd got bags. She tried to lift me up so I could see this damn bit of cake, and we were struggling. And a guy walked past, uh, and. He said, was I looking, trying to look at something in particular? I said, get that bit of cake, mate, you know. <laughs> and he must have been a curator because he got a key out of his pocket. He opened the case and he brought out the piece of cake. And that was... A, that was it was magical. Night. It was it? magical. Yeah. It was magical. I mean, it was magical partly because it was the excitement of mm. being, you know, eyeball to eyeball with a piece of Egyptian cake. Yes. But also he kind of demonstrated something that people will, you know, people will open cases for yeah. you. Yeah. People will open up the past. You know, it was a real, Gosh. a real kind of learning experience. And that backstage sense as well, as in, you know, being party to something that, that not yes, everybody else was party right. to. That's that. partly that, I yes, think. Yes, that's lovely. You know, and but I think that, you know, if there's one person I've got to thank for my career, I don't know who he was. No. Um, you know, he taught me about that excitement, and he also taught me to open cases for other people. I think was, yes. you yeah. know, I yeah. thought that was, um, and that kind of continued. Indeed, it did. As does that conversation, and uh, I've got to tell you, Mary Beard is a wonderful conversationalist, as, as you'd expect from such a brilliant communicator. Which was a phrase applied a moment ago to Captain Sir Tom Moore, not one I'd previously applied to him. But then neither did I know that he is. That, thank you to Simon in Stratford for this. Pop pickers is the oldest UK artist to have a number one single, beating Sir Elton John into second place. Did you know that? I've only got a minute left. Anna in Horsham can have it. Anna, make it count. Oh, bless you, James. Uh, James, um, Captain what? Tom, Tom Moore, Moore, Sir Captain Sir Tom Captain Moore. Sir Captain Colonel Saint <laughs> Captain Tom Moore. Saint, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> lovely, lovely pop, bloke. Pop, pop, chart, uh, what, pop what star. He... Chart topper. <laughs> pop star, yeah. Chart topper. Um, I, I mean, I, I cannot personally thank him enough for lifting, you know, spirits in yeah. general because we needed it. Doesn't need to make but sense. Do want... Doesn't need to make sense, does yeah. it? Yeah. But I, I do want to remind everybody that there were two children out there that I remember 
raising millions at exactly the same time. One in, is it and the I lad who slept in his tent? One lad slept in his tent, one guy cycled around his garden without stabilisers um, and all that sort of stuff. And I remember them like getting we, one We were day all mad, weren't we? Of, we were all um, quite mad. We were all absolutely but, but, bonkers, but in quite but a nice all, way. For, for some reason, we all focused on, on Tom. Oh, so you're complaining. Which is great. You're saying the kids should have got more attention. He nicked, he nicked the attention off the children. That lad who slept in a, a tent bit, for a hundred yeah. years, that got, I, I mean, that was remarkable. I kept thinking about Lumbago. Is that, is that a Madonna song? Last night I dreamt of Lumbago. Anyway, that's it for me for another week. I'm getting a bit delirious. Thank you. What's the maddest thing you did during the pandemic? Pro- Just in, in human terms, not, you know. I bought a kayak. You bought a kayak? <laughs> yeah, I bought did a kayak. I took it to Runnymede okay. and, I, and I swam in the River Thames. Well done. Yeah, and I've never, and I said, I remember saying it's to my wife, mad. "Oh, we'll do this, won't we, when we get back to normal? This is such a lovely time." Kayaks in that. the shed. Kayaks got a hole in it somewhere okay. in the garage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, if you missed any of today, what was the maddest thing you did? Um, I think it was I, when I actually had COVID mm. in 2021. Um, discovering halfway through the experience that my downstairs neighbour also had COVID and her entire family. She's Moldovan. He's Russian, and we ended up sitting on the front step together. Uh, drinking Moldovan red wine till about three in the morning. That's nice. It was nice. Are, 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 Great are, are, wine. Are you friends now? You, yes, we are. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go, you see. <laughs> if you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, Rewind Live Radio, or enjoy the whole show podcast. You'll also find all LBC shows there to catch up on and the best podcasts in the world, including Full Disclosure with This Week, as you just heard, Mary Beard. Rewind Live Radio on Global Player. Download for free from your app store or head to Global Player. Dot com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. Thanks very much, James. James O'Brien on LBC.